one. All right, Joe, good to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, I've been wanting to do this for a while. I think you got a very interesting story to tell. We've uh, put together a little map here in the background. We'll go over that. Uh, starting off, though, I want to just kind of get you know how how your life kind of started. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, about your, your childhood and how you grew up? So, I mean, my childhood, um, you know, I, it's upper middle class. Um, my parents, were, my father was a small business owner. My mom worked for Kraft Foods for 21 years. So, they, I mean, they worked their asses off to provide for me. Um, you know, life was good as a kid. Honestly, it wasn't really that bad except for uh, when I got into, like, middle school, I started to get bullied. But after that, it was really nothing. So where'd you grow up and where were you originally from? So I grew up in uh, a small suburb called Gross Point Woods in Southeast Michigan. It's a middle to upper class uh, neighborhood just north of Detroit. Um, you know, a pretty, a pretty basic, you know, suburbanite lifestyle. So were your parents uh, always in the house? Uh, you always have two parents when you're growing up? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, except for my later, so as a as a young child, you know, my my dad was running his own business. My mother was working for Kraft. She was the one that was always out traveling because she'd have to travel like northern Ohio for uh, to sell Kraft products, <laughs> basically. So I mean, she was she was basically a tra traveling saleswoman. She worked for them for a long time. Well, I got to say, Ohio, woohoo, go Browns. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't like Ohio. <laughs> Not in Michigan, brother. <laughs> so uh, can, can you describe to me uh, into your teen years and uh, while you were at school? You said that you, uh, you got bullied when you were younger. Uh, yeah, you know, high school high school was a little rough. You know, I, I got bullied quite a bit. Um, kind of a late bloomer, I guess you could say. You know, I, I didn't really come into being what I am now until I – served joined the military served in the military um it was definitely a game changer for me though because it kind of showed me hey everybody bullies you who cares you know i mean i when i got to basic i was bullied by my drill sergeants <laughs> it's just the way of life well uh, then you know getting on to that so how old were you when you joined and what were your reasons for joining so i i actually signed up at 17 uh, i did the delayed entry program um I basically told my mother because she was kind of kind of iffy about me joining. I basically told her, well, if you don't sign the paperwork now, I'm going to sign when I'm 18. <laughs> so she, she ended up signing for me. Really didn't give her much of a choice in there, did you? Oh. <laughs> no. I mean, it's, it's uh, so to kind of give some context and backstory is my, my father passed when I was 17. And I kind of started fucking around, smoking weed, drinking a lot. And which is stuff I never did before. And it was like the internet or the army was probably the best thing for me. Um, and it, it, it changed me for the better, some things for the worst, but you know, that's life. You know, you, you, you've got a lot of things that you deal with. So from before into joining, would you say that the military straightened you out? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I, I think if I hadn't joined the military, I, probably would have ended up in prison <laughs> not, not even gonna lie i was i was doing some dumb shit I, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing but i think that's i think that's a lot of people <laughs> yeah <laughs> i, think yeah, that's I a mean lot of uh, it, it, in my basic training platoon we had a guy that was it was army or prison really and he chose army yeah I mean, he's one of our best soldiers in basic training really oh yeah well, he, he had a reason to be there, you know. <laughs> he couldn't fuck. He couldn't fuck up. Otherwise, he, he'd go to prison. He had no choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, do you remember the day that you walked into the recruiter's office? Can you describe your experience? Oh, I don't think I remember the actual day that I first talked to a recruiter, but I remember my I remember my recruiter very well. Um interesting guy he had served with the 82nd he was a uh, 19 delta which is a cavalry scout you know basically kind of he's like man yeah you know you can join so i signed up with him and um crazy story with him i actually ended up talking to him once i got to my unit and there's more to that because uh unfortunately uh he's not alive with us anymore oh it was uh what exactly was the interaction when you finally got to your unit and then, uh, uh, 
so it was a, basically a phone call. It's like, hey, man, I, you know, I made it to my unit. He's like, oh, yeah, good for you. You know, I told him I was at the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell. I was very proud of being at the unit I was at. Um, but I found out like a year later that he had committed suicide, unfortunately. I mean, that's an unfortunate statistic in our field is a lot of veterans end up taking their own lives, unfortunately. There's a lot of baggage that a lot of people can't seem to uh, deal with after, yeah, after it happens. Yep. Eats yep, away they, at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is there, do, you, do you think that a lot of people on, on that topic, do you think that a lot of soldiers find it difficult to open up and talk about things that might be bothering them? Absolutely. <laughs> it took me many years to open up about um, a lot of my experiences and <clears throat> things that bothered me for a long time. Um, took me a very long time <laughs> to at least, I mean, I'd open up to certain people, but not everybody. Did, uh, was there ever a point where you said uh, that I, I have to talk to somebody? Um, yes. Uh, when I, if I can remember correctly, I think it was 2012. I was really going through a rough time. Uh, and I, I had separated in, uh, October of 2009 is when I separated from the military <clears throat> and I spent a good couple years just drinking too much and doing dumb shit. <laughs> it's just pretty much to, to fill a void. And it, it wasn't the right decision. I'll say that now. <laughs> I, I think every man, military service or not, gets to that point in their life. But I think military men definitely, they, they get there more often than not. Oh, There's, yeah. Unfortunately. I mean, was there... um. Let's let's kind of keep going with uh, with your story as uh, when you got to basic training. So, uh, w well, f first before we get to there, what was your family's reaction? You sort of told me about how your mother felt. Um, your father wasn't <laughs> necessarily in the picture at that point. He had passed. He was not. No, he he passed. Uh, I mean, he knew I wanted to join the army uh, before he passed. But what did he say before he passed? Why don't you join the air force? Join the Air Force, really? <laughs> yes. Why don't you join the Air Force? And I, I told him why, which the re the original reason why was because I wanted to fly helicopters. And okay. you have a better chance of flying helicopters in the Army than any other branch, period. Mm -hmm. The majority of the Air Force is ground crews, is what a lot yeah. of people don't yeah. realize. Well, <laughs> and they don't they don't have a lot of rotary wing aircraft. They, they're mostly fixed wing aircraft. Now... So, so your father was m more of a push towards going to the Air Force. Do, what about, you know, brothers, sisters, grandparents, other family members? What, what, were, what were their reactions? Were they supportive for you? Well, so I'm an only child, so I didn't have any brothers or sisters to say anything otherwise. Um, grandparents were mostly out of the picture at that point, except for my two grandmothers. And they were absolutely supportive of my decision. I mean, my grandfather and my uh, grandfather and my mother's side was an army sniper in world war ii and then my father on my dad's side was a uh, naval fighter pilot during world war ii so it was kind of in our family to serve our country yeah so just, it sounds like a like a slight military tradition there almost mm -hmm. a little there, bit a little bit w w was that part of the reasoning did you kind of think you know my the my forefathers served so i should serve also that was part of the reasoning. I mean, I growing up, I was playing uh, army all the time, you know, with fake guns, you know, the little yeah. light up electric guns. You know, uh, I think I was probably eight years old. I had this uh, light up with sound M60 that would like run a belt through it. And I, I would run up and down the block, just gah, 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 you know, just <laughs> playing army, man. My father had something similar and my older cousins had that. And I, that was uh, that was that was one of the that was one of the coolest toys ever. Oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, dude! I remember duct taping a like a flashlight to it to make it tactical <laughs> and shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of, kind the kind of, knowing you that 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 sh that uh, does not surprise me in the least bit. <laughs> you know, no. <nope. laughs> so no, it was kind of in my blood, man. Uh, you know, a, especially my grandfather, my one grandfather being a, a master sergeant in the army, and he was. Uh, basically trained troops going over to the Pacific theater, um, for marksmanship. Now, do you remember the day that you stepped off the bus at basic training? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, 
you know, when we when we stepped off the bus in 2005 or I'm sorry, 2006 uh, at Fort, I did my training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, and at the time, it was an only infantry training station. So anybody being infantry would be going through Fort Benning, Georgia in 2005, 2006, up into a certain point. I'm not sure when they changed it, uh, but for a while, yeah, it was absolutely only infantry, only male um, trade out course, basically. And it was uh, it was an OSIT, which means you did basic and your AIT through uh, you, you basically stay at the same unit. Okay, so the, to help build that camaraderie, so that way when you guys finally went to action, you guys had already known each other. You already worked together in basic well, training. Well, kind of yes and no. Um, I didn't, like, maybe three people from my basic training platoon went to the same unit at Fort, or similar units at Fort Campbell with me. Okay. Okay, so, so you, but there were familiar faces from basic training into there were a couple, finally deployed. There were a couple. I actually had a couple of guys that I was in basic training with in two of my units that I served with at uh, Fort Campbell. Okay. Do you remember <laughs> the first time you had a drill sergeant yelling at you? <laughs> Day one, brother. <laughs> Day one. D describe that to me. Was it was it a bit of a culture yeah. shock? Did you of ever course. Had... Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I had people yelling at me and bullying me as a kid, so it, was, it wasn't that bad. Um, what were those but, no, initial... it was not an opener. What were those initial yeah. gut feelings that you had when that occurred? Well, you know, you, you got some random guy screaming at you, you know, keep your keep your rucksack over your head like this. And it's like, you know, you're like, oh, my fucking God, like it's starting. <laughs> <laughs> it's here. We're starting it now. Did, in, in that moment, was there ever a hint of regret? Did you ever think maybe I shouldn't be here? You know, there was a couple times during basic training where I, I hit a low. And I was like writing my mom and I'm like, oh, my God, I, I, I just want to fucking come home. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to come home. But, you know, I, I toughed I toughed it out, toughed well, it through the whole situation. I, I ended up, you know, graduating as a uh, 11 Charlie, which is a indirect fire infantryman or mortarman for, you know, the civvies out there. So in those moments where you were starting to almost doubt yourself. What was it that you told yourself or reminded yourself to keep going? Well, what was it that inspired you to finish? I don't think there was actually anything that really inspired me. It was just kind of like, I'd rather be doing this than be back at home. So I just toughed it up and, you know, just kept going through. <laughs> Knuckle down, did what you had to do. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the man's way. I mean, I'll, I, I granted, I'll admit, you know, there was a point during basic training. I was like, I fucking hate this shit. I don't want to be here. <laughs> What's a memory from basic training that you will never forget? Funny. So can, or, 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 da or down in the dumps or lighthearted, any, anything. What's one, if you had to pick one thing, what is it? So we had a drill sergeant and I, I hope I can drop his name, um, Hope he ever sees this. Drill Sergeant Del Toro. He was a staff sergeant, E6. He was shorter than me, uh, Hispanic. Great fucking dude. Out fucking standing. Um, I've got a great memory of him literally during our final 12 miler for infantry school. This dude, probably about like up to here on me, mm -hmm. running up and down the formation with two Alice packs on his back just screaming at privates, come on, privates, let's go, move your asses, you can do this, you know. <laughs> and the best piece of advice he ever gave me was strength is in the heart, pain is temporary, and pride lasts forever. That is that is the best piece of advice I ever took from any NCO that I had in the Army. That man, that, that was a very wise man. That's, some, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's something that I, I think a lot of young men – rarely get that sort of advice at any point in their lives. Even, oh, that, even that older stuck men. with me my whole life, honestly. Those words have stuck with me. I can tell. He was, he was an excellent person. I mean, the, probably the best drill sergeant I had. Is there anything else about him that you remember? Um, I do remember, so it was a really unfortunate event during the last final month of my basic training um, or infantry school, basically, <clears throat> he lost his hat for disciplining a private. And I thought it was bullshit. 
When you because say he was talking shit. Luke. So <laughs> obviously something you can't do in 2006. Um, this private had the balls to tell him I'm better than you. And he basically put him on the ground with his knees in his chest and you're not better than me. And he lost his hat. Wow. Which I'm sorry, but drill Sergeant Del Toro was better than that private in every way. Because Wait. I mean, he was in my, he was in my platoon. Uh, I'm not going to name his name, but <laughs> when you say lost his hat, was he discharged? No, he wasn't discharged. He just lost his ability to train new recruits. Uh, they took his brown round. So the the drill sergeant hat that you are given um, when you become a drill sergeant. You see that there's a level of toughness that I think everyone should have, but especially in the military that, I mean, you're going to have struggles in life. Be oh, yeah. Interpersonal with work in the military you see in combat there are things that will approach you in life that will challenge you to your core very few things will ever simulate that like somebody oh, yeah. putting their hands on you oh and, yeah you know there is an aspect yeah I, I remember stories from you know my grandfather when he was in basic in korea their drill sergeants would straight up sock him in the face it's straight different it was totally different so i mean if you think about it i joined in in um Late 05, went to basic in early to mid 2006. And at that time, they weren't allowed to put your hands on you. Uh, it just wasn't a thing. <laughs> so. Well, it, there's something else I'd like to ask you. So recently, there's been a push in basic training where drill sergeants aren't allowed to yell at privates. And uh, I think that's wrong, personally. Well, I've heard from them, and you, give me your opinion on this. I have heard the instructor of drill instructors telling the, the new, the, the instructor trainees, if we will, telling them, if you need to yell, we don't need you. So I think that's wrong. How, give me I personally your... think that's wrong. Um, you know, it, it, it also, personally, I believe it depends on what job field you're in. Um, if you're infantry, you need that shark week. You need that chaos. You need to be broken down and be retrained. Because if that's the job you're going to do, you need to be capable of it. And you need to be able to operate in situations that, for most people, could be really life-changing and really mess you up. And you just you can't think about it at the time. You just got to push through it. You just got to push through. You got to do what you got to do. There's time to grieve later. You know, if you correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, it, is, is there not a point where they have to, is there not a point where they bring in the drill instructors who are in training to, is that not Shark Week where they bring them in to, where there's more drill sergeants than normal, and that's almost an aspect of their training is, is to yell at brand new recruits? So, no, um, basically the, the, the drill sergeants that would be involved in Shark Week would be your drill instructors for the entire time you're at basic training. Okay. So, so describe so, to me what Shark Week meant for you. <laughs> Shark Week was interesting because, you know, we, I spent two weeks at the replacement company at Fort Benning, which was kind of like you're in processing, you know, getting you into the Army, getting your gear, all that stuff. And then when we got to our unit, which we had to march uh, five miles, I think it was, to our unit. They didn't they didn't bus us there, <laughs> and we're carrying you know a duffel bag and our rucksack and all our new gear that we got. And it's a culture shock, I'll tell you that, because you know I came from a middle to upper class neighborhood, and then I'm you know I'm getting yelled and screamed at. Keep your fucking ruck above your head, you know, because at one point when we got to our unit, we had to literally hold our duffel bags over our head like this. And if you started to go down, no, keep it up, keep it up. <laughs> so, was there ever a point uh, during basic training? Because the military is very structured and very regimental. Oh, yeah. you, ha you have a oh, routine, yeah. you have a schedule. Was there ever a point where the drill instructors purposely disrupted the schedule? Woke you up in the middle of the night, changed things up on you guys, keep you on your toes? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Tell me something um, about that. So we had, I can't remember his name, but we had this one drill sergeant. Um, pretty sure he was, uh, he might have been Filipino. I don't want to butcher this, but he was a cool dude. Um, broken English whenever he talked. 
Um, but I remember that drill sergeant when we we had a thing called fire watch. Basically, during the nighttime, people would take or the recruits would take turns guarding the doors of the the unit, you know, our building, wherever our platoon was. And this drill sergeant would literally, we called him a ninja because he would literally climb in through windows that are two stories to, uh, up Whoa! and sneak in and try to catch private sleeping on fire watch. Oh. And he would get somebody every time, every time he'd get somebody. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, he knew what was up. Well, he, he didn't do the traditional, just bust through a, you know, one of the doors. He'd climb in through the window. <laughs> Well, busting through the door, you'd wake people up. And assuming that exactly. Made, yeah, make a lot no, of yeah, noise. Yeah, the fire watch guy, you're going to wake him up sleeping there. Mm-hmm. Now, what was your fire watch like in basic training? Um, hard to remember. <laughs> you know, I've, I've taken a few hits to the head since, you know, I, I went through basic training. But I did fire watch a few times. Um, I had that same drill sergeant actually try to creep up on me one night. And I looked straight at him the second I saw, you know, I heard him. He's like, good job, Private. And he moved on. <laughs> there you go. All right. So you, really cool, really cool drill sergeant for sure. Fantastic. Now, so after basic training, uh, you, well, was your training to be a mortarman part of your basic training? Or was that a, a, like almost like a post, like a secondary class that you had to go take? So when I went through basic training uh, for infantry, it was called OSIT. Um, I can't remember the, the, what it stands for at this point. Uh, but basically, you would go, you do your nine weeks of basic training. Then you would take a 36-hour pass with your family or whatever you want to do. And then when you got back, you started infantry school. So either 11 Bravo school or mortar school which when I got back, I started mortar school. Now, did you pick that or were there, were you selected to go do that? I was selected. Um, basically when I joined, I joined as 11 X-ray, which means you can be either 11 Bravo or 11 Charlie. Um, and when I got to my training unit at Fort Benning, they basically said, all right, you're all 11 Charlies now. Congratulations. <laughs> and okay. There was no warning, not a single bit of warning. No, no choice, no nothing. All right, here, nope. here, here, nope. here's the tube, here's the mortars, send them. <laughs> and it was basic. It was based off of uh, like your GT score, your ASVAB score. Okay. So, well, do you think your score helped your? Well, whether you would look at it as, as helped or not, do you think that your the way you scored had an impact on you getting selected? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I had a high GT score, which is usually like your uh, math and other things like that. So. You know, when I was going through, and you got to remember at the time, this is prior to the second surge into Iraq. Um, you know, they were just, <clears throat> I, I could have literally had any job I wanted, and I picked infantry, and then they just put me straight into mortar school because I had the math skills to do so. Well, you, you'd, you'd need it for calculations, mm -hmm. well, for, especially on the fly, needing to adjust mm -hmm. fire. Well, yeah, and I, you got to remember when you're a mortar, you know, you're usually providing close support, close indirect fire support for infantry on the ground. So you get, your math has got to be right, because if you're off by one or two degrees, you can kill friendlies. And it's a, the, a mortar system is a mass kill weapon. That's its only purpose. I'm reminded when you say that you watch the Pacific, correct? The HBO uh, I've seen series? a few episodes few episodes did you see the episode where they were in basic training and they were training the mortar crews no i did not unfortunately there is a scene where they are they're training the mortar crews and it's all under pressure initially you think they're in the fight until the camera pans out and shows that they're in basic training <laughs> they fire the mortar and they've got four dummies they have tojo fuckface i might have to beat that out <laughs> And then they got, <laughs> and then they got Bob and Joe, and they're they're not too far away from each other. Uh, honestly, the the whoever was directing it, I, you, what what is Danger Close that you remember? Do you remember so the distance? So Danger Close would be close to the um, frag range of a one or any of the mortar systems you're using. <clears throat> On a seventy-five um, millimeter mortar, what would that be? 
So there's no 75. You've got a 60, an 81, and a 120. What would they have used in World War II? Um, 81s and 120s. 80, okay, then it, uh, 60s would have been probably more within the like the light infantry units because a 60 is very easily easily you know carried by uh, a light infantry unit. Uh, when you start getting in the 81s and the 120s, those are a little bit heavier to carry. I mean, we do still light infantry unit 81s. However, the 120 is usually in a trailer or on a trailer mount um, in the back of a striker um, or just on a counter battery on a base. Well, I got, which in, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go well, ahead. I was going to say, because it, <laughs> in the show, these dummies are only maybe 15, 20 yards away from each other, the enemy and the friendlies. Okay. That has got to be within danger close. Well, that would be that would probably be a sixty mil mortar at that point. The, the, if, that, they're, if they're shooting that close, it, it, it was a very it was very thin tube. I wanted to say seventy five. I don't know why mm -hmm. that number came to head, but sixty millimeter <laughs> is likely what it was. And it land it mortar shell lands, not a scratch on Tojo or F face, but <laughs> but. Bob and Joe get two little dings on their helmet and n okay. nothing else anywhere. But the drill instructor then starts yelling at them. What did Joe do? Did he sleep with your wife? Why'd you kill him? <laughs> and w was there ever a point? So when you were training as a mortarman, was there ever a point where you, you were here? What was the first experience with mortar shells that you had and that you can remember? So we did some training. Um, we had a range at Fort Benning. Um, that had, uh, we were actually shooting 120s out of the back of a 145 at one point, which is something that we don't use anymore. Um, you know, the old tracked armored trucks yeah. from Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. So we did, uh, we did some, uh, oh, you're gonna have to edit this part out cause I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> oh, take, take but, your time. Uh, so basically you, you, you're going to have mounted 120s basically you, you, that's a possibility. Uh, nowadays, they run them on strikers. So uh, you can have a striker unit with three 120s and three strikers, and you can basically be a complete mobile mortar platform. Um, back in the day, you didn't have that, so you're carrying everything around with you. <laughs> so so when they're training you on effectively half tracks with a mortar uh, tube mounted on the back of it, was there ever a moment where you thought, why am I using all this old shit? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, we're, we're training on one, four fives. Um, but the, you know, our drill instructors at the time, they were like, well, you know, you're never going to use these. You're well, just going to use the modern equipment. <laughs> Did that ever dent your confidence of like, well, why am I training on the old stuff? I want to get my hands on the new stuff. Y yeah. Yeah. A little bit, <laughs> you know, Did you ever um, bring that up I to a drill instructor. No, you never ask. You don't. You don't question <laughs> shit. Not not when I went through. You don't question anything. You you're just yeah. You know, yeah. Roger Jones aren't. If you would have, what would have happened? I <laughs> uh, probably would have gotten smoked. Got which smoked. Is, you know, push ups, sit ups, flutter kicks, whatever they whatever the drill instructor wants. <laughs> Again, sadly, they're not allowed to do that. They call that hazing nowadays. Yeah, not hazing nowadays. It's bullshit. So, the um, what about your graduation? When you graduated, was your mother there? Uh, so uh, graduation from infantry school uh, and basic training. My mom came to my basic training uh, graduation, <clears throat> which was fun because I got to get off base for 36 hour pass. Um, at the end of infantry school, my mother and my grandmother showed up and my mother was able. So in the infantry, you get a blue cord around your right shoulder mm -hmm. to signify that you're an infantry infantrymen in the army <clears throat> and my mother uh she i would have rather had my dad do it but my mother was able to be there to pin my blue cord on my right shoulder for my uniform and nope. i mean that's probably been my best memory from graduating describe uh, to me school. those feelings describe to me what how, how you felt was i it... was fucking done and i got to be out of that fucking place <laughs> <laughs> So it was a relief. It was weight off Fort your shoulder Benning, finally. Bro, I hated it. I hated Fort Benning. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I heard I heard a drill instructor once say that if if your basic training is the most difficult time that you have in the military, then we've done our job right. <laughs> yeah, that's not wrong. 
that's not wrong. <laughs> well, was it for you? Um, probably it was one of the most difficult things I had to do in my life. Um, you know, I obviously I grew up in a middle to upper class family, you know, and it was definitely a culture shock and an awakening. Like be having grown ass men screaming at me, telling me to do things, you know, it was different. It was definitely different, but I made it through. I served, you know, just about five, close to five years. Now, beforehand, before your service, nobody probably said these words to you. How do you feel about them now? Thank you for your service. Uh, it's always an awkward thing. It's like, it's like you don't know how to respond. You know, it's, you did it as a job. You didn't really do it to, oh, what do you want to call it? Like to serve the country. It was like, it was just another job. I mean, literally, I just had somebody thank me for my service earlier today. And I was like, oh, yeah, thank you. You know, it's like, it's, it's so weird to me. Ha, ha, have you ever just said, you're welcome? <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> you should give that a try. Give it a try. Because I've, I've never heard anybody just say, you're welcome. And, and, and Yeah, thank, t- me, thank <laughs> me for my service. Thank you. <laughs> so now, now we get into the meat of your service. So yeah. when you deployed. Uh, what? So when you were first deployed, what was your first site when you arrived to Iraq? So uh, my first site... <clears throat> Uh, I remember, so I was part of Torch Party, which uh, any vets watching this, they would know exactly what that means. Uh, so the Torch Party of your group is the the first troops from your platoon company to make boots on ground, to make the transition with the unit that you're replacing. Um, I remember the smell. It was weird. <laughs> weird, weird smell to the area. Describe it. Hmm kind of metallic like burning honestly. metal not burning metal but just kind of like a metallic smell to the uh that i mean think about the munitions we dropped you know all the part the metal particulate in the sand and the dust and everything we're breathing in you know every every it was a very weird place very hot <laughs> not well, as hot sure. as kuwait though thankfully <laughs> did you you were in kuwait as well uh so every during during the global war on terrorism, every every soldier spent at least two weeks at uh, either Camp Buring or one of the other camps in Kuwait uh, to acclimatize to the climate. And then they would be sent off to wherever region of Iraq or Afghanistan that they were going to be serving in. Describe that to me when you when you first. So when you first got to the Middle East in Kuwait, what was oh, that? Like? God, Um so I remember we 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 actually took a civilian flight over um, the civilian flight. Uh, it was manned by, you know, um, civilian pilots, uh, the um, stewardess uh, stewardesses <laughs> were all civilians. Uh, but the flight was entirely military. We left out of Fort uh, Fort Campbell in Kentucky, went to um, Frankfurt, Germany. And then after Frankfurt, Germany, we went to Kuwait and it was probably a, uh, I want to say it was probably 13 hours to Frankfurt and then 16 hours to Kuwait. So you, so you spent 39 hours on a plane. Just getting to Kuwait How, to what, acclimatize, to go to Iraq. <laughs> okay. Or 29, 29 hours. Does, okay. What were you jet? I'm assuming you were. You had to be jet lagged when oh, you yeah. got there. Well, it, so usually the medics would give us Ambien. <laughs> so it was, it oh, was okay. really nice, man. Yeah, you had a good um, time, by the way. <laughs> no, I fucking slept the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> especially my my trip home uh, when we were leaving. Um, we let's see, we all we all got helicoptered to uh, Cop Spiker, which was the name of the uh, the base at the time in Tikrit. And then we took a uh, C-130 flight out to Kuwait. And then once we got to Kuwait, we spent a couple weeks there. And then I remember the medics, you know, hey, everybody gets two Ambien for the flight home. (laughs) (laughs) What was the reaction from you? I was like, fuck yeah, dude, I can fucking sleep. (laughs) I can fucking sleep. So I slept. 
I slept the whole flight to Shannon, Ireland, which was the trip home. And then the whole, I, so I popped the first one before we even got wheels up uh, in, in <laughs> Kuwait. I remember passing out <laughs> while we were going up in Kuwait. I remember waking up in Shannon, Ireland. And then uh, after we did our layover there, I popped the second one. I fucking slept the whole rest of the way to Fort Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a, were, were there any people who freaked out when they were getting on? Like, oh my god, this is actually happening. I'm actually heading to war. Um, no, not really. Um, you know, we we had months of buildup. Um, you know, we had training. Obviously, lots of training before we even deployed. Uh, we were originally so our unit was originally supposed to deploy to Afghanistan. Um, and then I remember two months out. <clears throat> when uh, just before Bush signed the second surge and our unit, uh, first brigade combat team, 101st got new orders to go to Iraq instead of Afghanistan. Okay. Now, so was that, did that affect your opinion of why you joined? Cause uh, now to back up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You join. Your rationale for joining, let's 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 indulge into that for a moment. Okay. What was was there an event? Was there anything you remember that said, <laughs> I am joining this immediately? Like I, I have to go. 9-11. Now, knowing that, Afghanistan probably would have been in your crosshairs. You would have I, said, I, I'm well, going if that's I'm, who did it. <laughs> I'm taking the fight to the men who attacked us. How did that conflict if it did with now changing course and heading towards iraq so i mean it it really didn't conflict um at the time you know being a soldier being an infantryman my job was to go to wherever the action was right um and the 101st is one of those 24 to 48 hour deploying units you know so if they get orders from the president they got to be able to deploy within 24 to 48 hours okay so that, that's just where I was at, and <clears throat> absolutely would not change who I served with. The hundred and first was, I mean, they're a glorious unit. You just look at history. <laughs> the hundred and first man to be able to wear that, uh, that screaming, you know, screaming eagle on my shoulder. That was such an honor. Now, so when you when you got down in the Middle East. So we're going to we're going to go a little bit past landing in Kuwait. When you arrived in Iraq, was there this feeling of it's go time? The action's going to start now. Did you have that was there a rush for you or did it kind of was it sort of a feeling of uh, okay, I've I've been prepared. I know what I'm doing. So uh, describe to me the feelings that you had when you finally got to where you were going to be fighting. So that's that's a weird one because, like I said, I was part of Torch Party for my unit, which was some of the first boots on ground for my unit. Uh, basically, when I first got to the FOB, which I was flown in on a uh, uh, a Chinook from FOB Anaconda, which was in Balad, we got flown in. We were the first part of our unit to get there. And pretty much all we did at that time was check uh, our quad cons and connexes, which are the, the shipping containers. Uh, first thing we did was check those, make sure our gear was okay. And then within the first week, we were doing ride alongs with the unit that we were replacing for the, for the area of operation, uh, which was third of the 503rd parachute regiment from 82nd airborne. Okay. Um, I do remember my first time rolling out. It was dead of night. <laughs> nods on. It was nods only. And uh, I remember us taking fire. <laughs> first night mean? out. Um, you realize you're in the shit. <laughs> Immediately. Describe me the feelings. Um, was, there, was there fear? Was there anxiety? Absolutely, or... man. I, I was fearful. I was anxious. Um, you know, it's, it was something I had never experienced before. Uh, the last time I had experienced any kind of being shot at was the um, night infiltration course at Fort Benning, where you're literally low crawling up a, you know, 
sandy whatever while people are shooting 240 bravos over your head now what was different about that from course to it actually happening well you're actually getting shot at well that's what well, <laughs> well, that's what i'm <laughs> going to say so for, for, for those who haven't served when you in training they're not trying to hit you in combat they're trying to kill you. Absolutely. What's what was the difference in your in your mental state, in your emotions? What, what was it was there a flood of emotion that you had immediately or were you were you trying to hide away that? Were you trying to kind of act cool under the pressure? What what was that? It was that more like? so like um holy fuck I'm in the shit. I'm getting shot at. This is <laughs> this is life for the next 15 fucking months. Now, after that, when you fought, when you got back, when, I'm assuming somebody had to ask you what you know what happened. What was it like? Mm-hmm. What did what did you tell them, your um, fellow soldiers, when you when you got back and you and you had to report what had just happened? Well, there was nothing really like that. I mean, uh, the soldiers I served with were literally sh- we were all shoulder to shoulder the whole 15 months we were there. Okay. Um. So, like, you didn't really deal with a lot of soldiers at, obviously, there's soldiers staying at Garrison on FOB, or not on the FOB, but at the base that you're out of during your, while you're deployed. Um, So, yeah, there was really nothing like that. It was just, we were there, (laughs) you know. Um, Everybody was shoulder to shoulder. Everybody was covering each other's six. You know, it's, it's just the way of life in the Army. Now, that first night, did you shoot back yourself or no? No. I was sitting in the back seat of a, a one, uh, 1114 uh, series Humvee, uh, which is just a basic, a 998 that's been up armored. Okay. Was the, How close was the gunfire to you? I'd say within about 100 meters. Okay. So, you know, we, we had people popping off AKs at us within 100 meters. Uh, just pot shots, obviously. So, so they were a hundred meters, or the Browns were landing a hundred meters within you. No, they were they were probably within a hundred meters of us shooting at. That's us. close. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I remember one of the the big engagements. Um, we the Charlie Company hundred first or first brigade combat team hundred first reported when they all when everybody got there, we switched out with the eighty second unit. <clears throat> they took some major fire one day. Um. I remember it because we were out escorting EOD around all day in downtown Samara. And it was initiated by a dump truck ID or VBID, a uh, vehicle borne ID for people that don't know, um, rolled into an Iraqi army checkpoint and detonated. And it kicked off an entire day. <laughs> um, Charlie Company literally, literally reported at one point having a bongo truck, which is like a, a K truck from Japan with a Dushka mountain in the back, engaging them in the daytime, in the open. <laughs> wow. Yeah, some crazy, and we're talking November of 2007. So, I mean, it, we're way into the war at this point. These guys are that brazen coming out and, you know, literally trying to light us up with a Dushka on the back of a bongo truck. Did, was there ever a point where you said, I got to give it to these guys, they got balls? <laughs> I mean, we had we had a few guys just you know every time we get in contact with them, you, nope, yep, two forty Bravo, just let let's let it sling. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, being a mortarman, what what is the most difficult aspect of your job before we get into you seeing combat? Uh, getting your numbers right. Uh, your numbers if you're right. off, so it, let's get into context with that. Um, with a mortar gun system, you have a deflection and elevation. All right. So when you set your guns in, you've got these poles and they, they look like candy canes cause it's white and red stripe down it. And you, you're going to have your assistant gunner run out and lay those in so that you can sight your, your gun in. And then after you sight your gun in, you'll have fire direction control or our FDC within our platoon GPS mark our guns and make sure we're laid in properly. And they get nowadays beforehand, they'd have to do all that shit by hand. Um, When I was in, they had little Palm pilots, like, you know, 
hand computers and they could literally type in a grid coordinate and it would give them the deflection and elevation for each gun. So it would, it's like instant. We could put rounds on target. Was there ever a time where you were hesitant to take that, to take those numbers and put them in where you ever Mm -mm. thought, I hope this is right. No, 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 because the way we were trained is, is if you have fire direction control or FDC giving you numbers, you put them down. And if we hit friendlies, that's on FDC. I mean, they're the ones calling in the direction and elevation for your guns. And if they call it in on friendlies, well, that's on them. Was there ever a time where that happened? Uh, One. So I don't know if I can talk about it, but one of the uh, mortar missions we did in Iraq, uh, we did shoot danger close and got very close to the battalion commander and the battalion sergeant major. Um, I, I remember it very clearly hearing the sergeant major and the battalion commander calling over radio too close, danger close, danger close. And we had to check fire. Who was shitting their pants right then? Um, Everyone. I don't think anybody was shit in their pants. I think it was more of just, we're doing our job. Oh fuck. We fucked up. Let's correct. Okay. Very professional attitude towards it. Well, that's, <laughs> you have to, you, you, you got to be professional in the military. Absolutely. Now, so can you describe your first engagement where you oh. actually were sending rounds down range at the enemy? Um, so our first engagement, I believe it was January of 2008 um, as a, as a mortarman. I mean, you got to remember, I did a lot of other, uh, basically during my tour, um, we were tasked with escorting Navy EOD around or explosive ordnance disposal because we were mortars. Mortars are a mass kill weapon. You can't really do that during like a police operation, which was basically what we were doing in 2007, 2008. We're just keeping the peace. Okay. Now, so in that moment, when when you, the first time you saw combat and you were fighting, can you describe that to me? That initial action starts going, I'm sending my rounds down range. Can you describe what was going through your head at the time? Um, really, there was nothing. I, I was concentrated on my job as an assistant gunner, uh, which was my job. Um, and, and as assistant gunner, you basically drop the rounds down the tube and you grab the rounds from your um, ammo bearer. So you're going to have an ammo bearer, you're going to have an assistant gunner, and then you're going to have a gunner. The gunner is the guy that makes sure the mortar system is on site and where it needs to be. The assistant gunner is going to be the one that's dropping the rounds down the tube. And then you have an ammo bearer or multiple ammo bearers that make sure the rounds are ready pre-firing. Do you remember the first round you sent in combat? Um, no, uh, it was a, it was a wild week. <laughs> we were out in the middle of fucking nowhere, man. Nowhere, Iraq, Ali al Sadin province. Uh, We were providing mortar fire for troops clearing a reed field. So, I mean, the reeds were literally probably about here above my head. So if you walked in the reed field, you you literally couldn't see shit. We have the map up. So where... I'll make that full screen. (sighs) I see the map, but I'm... Do you you have any idea where... For that operation, I cannot tell you. Now... If we zoom in here. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to have my, my boys from no slack battalion just fucking flipping shit right now. Cause they're going to see this old, <laughs> these old areas of operation. Now patrol base Olson. Yes. Describe to me the patrol base. It was small, very small, right on the outskirts. I mean, if you can look, there used to be a roundabout, uh, probably if you move your mouse cursor down, there was probably a roundabout a little bit further down from that, um, which is obviously not there anymore. We might be um, able to go back in time on this. But we mm-hmm. did have a, so our Charlie company was manning that patrol base. And then we had a group from special forces um, that were also based there. Um, 
man, their their tech was the best, man. Their their Humvees were out fucking standing. Really? <laughs> um, well, one of them had a naval mounted dual two forty Bravos, which wow. are side by side two forty Bravos with um, the feed and the exit, and they would just drain into a bag. Um, and then they had a minigun on one of their Humvees, which was fucking wild. <laughs> Describe that to me. Um, it's a sound you can't unhear. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. Um, and it was only a five, five, six minigun. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too crazy. It wasn't three Oh eight. Um, but Holy shit. It was this deafening just Wah! whenever they test fire him or let him off probably the, one of the coolest guns mounted guns I saw while I was in the military, except for the 240 Bravo, the 240 Bravo. I would take that any day over an M250 cal. And I know a lot of people are going to be shitting their fucking pants right now, but I'd rather take a 240 Bravo or a 50 cal because it's a fucking laser gun. <laughs> now. So was there ever a point where you were, uh, were you allowed to shoot the minigun or the twin fed? No, I no, wish. No, you wish? I totally, I wish. I wish. The the minigun was definitely a bucket list of mine. <laughs> no, um, as, fa- as far oh. as small arms, as it were, uh, was there ever a time where you had to fire your small arm or any small arms, as it were, other than your, your tube? There were a couple times. Um not a whole lot in my situation just because uh so since we were uh the battalion mortar platoon we didn't get to do our job very much so we were tasked with um escorting eod around the ao okay so whenever there was a call for a weapons cache or a possible id we would have to roll out with the navy eod unit that was attached to us Do you remember anything on those patrols that really stands out? Not necessarily combat, but something that something that you that you'll never forget about so, being on those patrols. I will say this: so within the the first uh, four or five months we were there, when we first got there, um, I couldn't believe how the people of Samara were living. They didn't have running water. They had no trash service. And I remember seeing streets and corners filled up with um, trash. Um, People were literally like dumping buckets of poop and piss on the side of their house in the drainage ditch and lighting it on fire to get rid of it. Um, Very barbaric, unfortunately. I mean, it's just like a country that had all these services and you know now you're talking mid 2000s and they don't have any of it anymore what did the river look like the river tigris river was something interesting to see i mean it was uh very green (laughs) very very green uh not blue um i remember every time we went near the river uh the heat would rise quite a bit because of the humidity off the river do you remember what the river smelled like? Uh, so you didn't really smell the river. Really? <laughs> you know, you smelled, uh, I don't remember that at all. Um, I remember more, more so smelling like burning trash and um, that, that specific smell you get when explosives go off. Okay. Cause I know some, cause I would imagine that a lot of these people were dumping trash and waste to float down yeah. the river and I... oh no they didn't they didn't really dump it in the river that much really? it was mostly they would just dump it out in front of their house and they'll light it on fire there oh ah, yeah okay okay i can see that mm-hmm. the uh because I, I with that image in my mind i was thinking you know the the river would have to have a smell all to its own because i would have imagined they would be sending their waste products down into the river but if they're just burning it no so the entire city smelled like burned trash burned trash burnt shit um it was a terrible terrible smell (laughs) uh you know i remember uh being a gunner on a 240 bravo on a a humvee you know or or one of the mraps we had rolling in downtown samara and it just smelled like absolute utter shit (laughs) wow 
Uh, and it, the nice thing was, is later on, um, we finally re were able to restore trash services to the city, you know, protect them, let them do their thing once we pushed the insurgency out. And it was like cleaned up within a matter of days. Uh, you say protect them. Were were the insurgents attacking the trash men? Well, they would they would attack anybody that was American or American contractor. You know, it was so. Just... So were trash services American contractors, or were they people who had lived in the city? Um, I'm not sure for that certain, but um, I do remember uh, our the service that took care of our. Uh, porta johns on base because we had porta johns instead of you know shit houses with burn barrels which was really nice <laughs> you know we didn't have to burn our own shit yeah um, that would be nice and i can't remember what country they were contracting from but it was it was a european uh country that they were contracting out of okay and they would come around every morning before anybody was up and suck out all the porta johns and then spray them down and that was always the best time to go take a shit. <laughs> I bet. I bet. The amount of job sites that I've worked on where they never clean the damn porta Oh, my John. God. I, yeah, well, you, yeah. See, at our fob, man, if you went later in the day and, like, in the evening, it was piled up at the bottom and, you know, no, it smelled like crap. I mean, you're baking in 120-degree weather all day. Yeah, no. <laughs> Is it like the private sector where they put the porta john purposefully where it's always out in the sun and it always cooks? So we actually had a little, like little wooden structures with like a half roof covering them. Like we'd have probably about four or five of them lined up in front of each um, building where all our chews were at, which our chews were basically a connex with windows cut out and a door cut out. And that's what we lived in. Okay. Very interesting. So what else do you remember about living there? at the base like did you have your own room were you in a tent in a barracks how, how, how what was the setup so i was basically in a connex um connex shipping container one of the big ones um and they would they would basically put two two soldiers per connex okay and i got lucky because the one i got uh, put into already had the the previous soldiers had built a wooden wall with doors in between so okay. it was nice because me and my roommate had total privacy. Okay. Now, you know, was there ever, do you, did you ever have a bad roommate? <sighs> Not deployed. Um, but, uh, you know, while I was in garrison here in the States, I had a couple. Can you, uh, so from living in, from, you know, bunking in the States to being overseas, what are the differences? What are the similarities? Can you describe to me some of that? So uh, at Fort Campbell, when we were, you know, living in our barracks rooms, they were basically three-story, three-story three, three, three story tall uh, apartment complexes built next to the battalion uh, headquarters. So you'd have three levels. You'd have first level, second level, third level. Um, and they were just two-person, basically, apartments. Now, like being, small though, small. Yeah, you have well, very almost like a studio apartment. I'm imagining. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Is there was there ever a point where you kind of thought to yourself while you were over there, you know, li living in effectively a connex box? Was there ever a time where you thought, "Geez, I, I wish we would, I wish we would change this," or "I wish we had had something a little bit better." Uh, obviously, overall, you could improve the the position, but was there ever just like one thing where you were like, "Damn, I wish they would figure this out." A better way to do this i mean we thought about it a few times but we just we just kind of lived with our condition you know we lived just with it. it's it. just it's just it's the the that's life for the time we're here and we're going to deal with it that's basically how it went <laughs> okay now living at olson was there a... well so i didn't stay at olson um i, I basically a couple times there but i the majority of my time in Iraq, I, I spent at Fob Brassfield Mora. Okay. Now, so focusing in on Olson, though, mm -hmm. did the enemy have a schedule as to whether they shoot at you or they target your patrols? Was there ever a time where, you, where things were very on, on a schedule with you and the enemy? Not so much. Um, 
the so during the first probably about five to six months while we were there um <clears throat> obviously i knew every time we rolled into downtown samara um all the shops would be closed there'd be nobody on the streets um and we'd roll in to go deal with an id protect you know obviously rolling with eod and the navy boys do those navy eod guys are fan fucking tastic they are a class people that know their job very well um <clears throat> but no i i have very good memories of rolling into samara and there was nobody on the street every store every store was closed nobody's out because they knew that the second we rolled in we'd be attacked and nobody none of the civilians would want, would want to be on the street for that now, did the civilians at any point blame you because every time you came in, something was going to happen, or did they thank you for coming in to take care of the bombs? Was there was there ever a what was the interaction between you and the civilians? So most of the civilians liked us being there. However, probably about two deployments prior to us being there, uh, a unit from Third Brigade, Hundred and First, was there, and they actually got. There were soldiers, uh, I don't know if you were able to put this on your podcast, but there were soldiers that got charged with um, assault and rape from the 101st. So when we got there and they saw our shoulder patches, the 101st, the Screaming Eagle, they were fucking terrified of us. Oh. Uh, did, uh, did, did you find out from... Uh, locals, from basically. Locals or we found out from locals. Okay. Uh, you know, our interpreter would be like, yeah, they're, they're fucking scared of you guys. Cause you're, you're wearing the, the, you know, the screaming Eagle patch. Did the um, military ever say anything or did they try to keep that hush hush? Well, no, the, the soldiers that were charged from third brigade combat team, um, they were charged and sentenced for the, the rape and the misconduct they had gone through. But I mean, the damage was already done. You know, the local saw our patch and they thought we were fucking terrible people. Really? Mm hmm. What, did you guys ever try to explain to them that well, we're not the same men who did that? Uh, I'd say our actions while we were there for our 15 months definitely changed the perception of our unit with the locals there. Our actions do speak louder than words. Yeah. We, yeah. You know, we, we did a lot to secure the city of Samara. Uh, about six months in, you know, our, our engineer unit was building a, a full dirt berm around the outside of the city on the... the if you look on your map here, on the western north and western side of the city, we built, you could probably see the outlines of it. We built a whole dirt berm. If you go west a little bit, nope, west. Yeah, we are going, <laughs> we are going west? East. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you east. mean east. Okay. East, east, oh, east. So oh, zoom in right here. East. You can see the lines. I'm east. I'm sorry. I thought you said west. I did say west. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look, you can see the lines from the dirt berm that our unit actually built there to protect the city from insurgents just coming in through the desert and that that big line right there that's one of the dirt berms we built or at least the engineer unit built while we were there do you remember and you anything can see along all line? the iraqi army and the iraqi police posts along that dirt berm gotcha that's what these are okay wow do you is there anything about the construction of that that you remember so no, because I wasn't involved in it. Um, my time while I was there was specifically rolling out with EOD and protecting EOD. Wow, that's that is. I'm looking at our scale right now. We're looking at you know this is in mm -hmm. meters, obviously, but this oh, yeah. is, this has got to be this has got to be at least anywhere from three three to five miles of berm. Mm -hmm. Well, it was it was an amazing feat. Um, so when we deployed the 82nd unit that we replaced, if I'm not mistaken, it was the third of the 503rd. And they were getting their, no, you know, no offense to the 82nd, but they were getting their asses kicked. Um, I believe that the unit that was there that we replaced lost 32 soldiers during their deployment before we got there. 32 out of how many? Now you think battalion sized, oh gosh. Yeah, man, I can't even remember what a battalion size is at this point. Um, but yeah, it, that's out of a whole infantry battalion. They've lost 32 people, which, I mean, any any casualties for the Army is bad. 
Absolutely. Well, there is a there is an aspect of that losses are expected, but any are a tragedy. Mm-hmm. Was there ever a point, you know, while living here that you f- obviously there were times where you felt unsafe, likely in combat. Oh, abs- absolutely, yeah. <laughs> were there ever and times? A lot of times you don't even think about it. You're well, you're just your your head is okay, what do I need to do to protect my soldiers to my left and right? And what do I need to do to survive? You don't think about being scared, especially after the first couple times you take contact. It's after that, it's just, okay. <laughs> it's, it's whatever at that point. Now, being at patrol base Olson, were there ever times there that, because that, that's, that's, that is your base. You, you, that, that is the most fortified position for the U.S. military in this city. Well, so, that, yeah, that was the most for the city itself, but I, I think I showed you earlier where I was actually at, which was Fob Brassfield Mora. Um, I only had certain interactions at Patrol Base Olson just because we'd roll down there with EOD. Um, and, yes, that's the, what you're showing right now would be where Fob Brassfield Mora was. I have more. So, so it's Brassfield Mora. So M O R A. We'll call it Mora. M O R A. Mora. Which it's it's named after two soldiers that died there, basically. So Brassfield and Mora were two soldiers that died in the region, and then the base was basically renamed to that. Now, so so you spent more of your time at Mora than you did yes. over at Olson. Now, yes, being at so so Mora being you know your so within the city olsen is the most fortified position mora in the area that was our main fob now was there ever a time being in the main fob that you felt i am this is not safe this is so we did get uh we got rocketed and mortared a couple times can you describe Um, that to me (laughs) well the funny thing about that is is i wasn't even scared like I remember it happening. We were somebody. They were checking night vision, our our night vision serial numbers, and for some reason they had us in a full formation, which you don't do in Iraq, you know, because a spotter's going to see you, you know, whole bunch of troops in a formation. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got rocketed, and the rocket landed on the other side. So basically, where we were basically here, in formation. Behind us was a line of MRAPs, all right? The rocket landed on the other side of the MRAPs. And I remember when it happened, because myself and the rest of the mortar platoon and the scout platoon for headquarters company, we all turn around, right? And all I remember seeing is all, like, the the guys that did, like, admin, um, because headquarters company, that's got all your admin people. So they're the guys doing your paperwork, supply, all the other stuff, supporting the infantry. I remember seeing all those guys just fucking sprinting at us <laughs> towards <laughs> towards the bunkers, which, which were just, you know, N-shaped concrete bunkers. He just kind of, like, went in. So I, I turn around to see what happened, and I could just see a sea of pogues running at me, <laughs> people other than grunts. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'll move in the same direction as them. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the leader. I mean, I knew, dude, I knew, you know, I heard the boom. I didn't die. Well, obviously, it didn't hit anywhere near us. <laughs> now, you know, being under fire at that point, did it kind of, uh, did it change your aspect of how this, of how the war was going? Did you feel, oh, they can shoot back? Was there ever a... Not really. We knew they could shoot back. Um, How often did they? It was they? more... I, it, so in the first probably like four months when we were operating in the area, it was probably like a constant day-to-day thing. You know, it was, you could get shot at. Um, once we pretty much pushed the insurgency out of downtown Samara, it was they resorted to IEDs. So they would just plant IEDs and try to blow us up instead of trying to stand up fight us. Because every time... They try to stand up fight. Well, <laughs> they got fucked up. Well, and I, I know that you have uh, a uh, few incidences of IEDs, and I, I'd like to get into that if you. Uh, mm-hmm. So now, how many times w- were you hit with an IED in convoy or any large explosions near you? So um, I personally, I was hit by a very large one. 
Um, the other convoys I've been in, maybe small, very small, um, once or twice. <clears throat> uh, obviously, I've been around a, a, several vehicles getting really fucked up. Uh, I've got pictures of an EOD Jerv uh, taking a 155 to the front end, which was wild. Um, if you have those pictures worst... and you'd like me to share them in the video... Feel free yeah. to send them to me. Oh yeah, I can I can send them to you. I can send them. I can say I actually have the pictures from the Cayman MRAP that I was driving that was blown up that I can send you if you want to add that Absolutely. to the podcast. Absolutely, I could put that in the post. Now I got to bust out the old Iraq fucking hard drive, brother. <laughs> now, so how many times were you hit directly? Um, three total. Now, the first time. Was that first an... time was nothing. It was just kind of like it peppered the truck. Nothing big, you know. Where were you uh, in the truck? Uh, driver. You were driver. Yes, now... I I did. So my primary job since um since mortars can't really do their job in a police you know action. I I guess you could say Iraq was. Um, at least at the point when I was there, um. I only, so my main jobs, I did a lot of driving because I was one of the few guys that didn't wear glasses and I was good at driving. Um, <clears throat> served quite a bit of time behind a 240 Bravo in a gun turret on a Humvee MRAP. Fun times. I love the 240 Bravo. Such a fantastic machine gun. Um, and then I also did a lot of time as a uh, radio radio operator uh sitting in the back of a cayman mrap uh working the radios uh you know making calls to uh battalion and, um which battalion basically ran our air, area of operation okay now to f to focus in a little bit on that first time that that you got hit give me give me the second by second play by play of those moments I, it was we were just driving around and it it poof went off and it you know nothing happened we just kept driving through it didn't did, did you initially know what had happened or, or were you kind of like oh that was weird um it was kind of like it was weird it was really like, it was just like wait did that really just happen <laughs> well was there anybody riding with you who was like oh we just got hit by an ied well yeah of course you know everybody started freaking out and they're like all right keep going through <laughs> that's all you can do oh, well, you, right. you don't we want were to lucky pop. <laughs> Well, you don't want to stop because usually IEDs, um, so when we were over there, if you get hit by an IED and you get disabled, usually that means there's going to be a counterattack within the same time frame. So usually when you get hit, there's a group of insurgents waiting to start shooting at your convoy. When you stop. But if yes. You, if you keep going, now, now by keep If you by, keep going, that gets you out of the danger zone. Well, but so is there an aspect to that of by continuing to go and getting out of the danger zone? basically shrugging it off do you think that gave them That's the perspective well but do you think it gave them the perspective of oh shit these guys don't give a fuck like well, they, well, what do you think was going through there because they had to be watching you to be ready well, to they pounce. always were watching us um which the uh, the catastrophic ied debt that i went through where i lost my one friend they were recording the whole thing really so um well which we'll get into this later uh scout platoon for our company actually went in and found the guy and took care of him. Okay. So, well, um, so, so when, when was the catastrophic one? Was that second or third? Uh, the, so no, that was a single one. Uh, it was May 18th of 2008 is when that one happened. Um, one of my fellow soldiers and a friend of mine passed, uh, on the life flight, uh, to the hospital basically. So we, we, I put him, I helped put him on the Black Hawk. And he was alive and he was awake. And I guess he died in flight. How did that feel? It hurt. <laughs> it hurt a lot. What, how, um, what was morale like for everyone? It was pretty tough because that was really the first, that was the first major catastrophic that my platoon went through. Was um, there, were, was, was there ever a point where people were like, we got to go back out there. We got to get, we got to avenge him. We have to go get, we got to get some pain. We didn't back. have to deal with that. No, didn't no, have no. to scout, scout platoon took care of that, which how soon after uh, did scout platoon get a hold of him within a month, within a month, within a month, where'd they, um, where'd they find him? I don't know. 
I uh, don't know who it was. Don't know where they found him. I, as far as I know, it was very close to where we were hit. How did they find? Um, how, how did they find out who it was? Did they track him back from the video? That I don't went know up, any or? of that either. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, so Scout Platoon and our headquarters company were basically made up of shooters and snipers. Okay. Uh, a lot of them went to sniper school. Um, pretty much all of them were rocking uh, suppressed M- painted M4s. You know, tan paint, tan bowflaged M4s with suppressors. So I mean, they were they were the best of our unit. Now, as a mortarman, what were you issued with as a as a small arm or as a sidearm? So I I was not issued a sidearm. A uh, sidearm was only for platoon leader and uh, platoon sergeant. Um, okay. The only weapon I was um, basically issued was an M4, and then during my time as a gunner, I was issued a uh, M240 Bravo. Now, to continue on the line of the IEDs that you had close contact with. So the first one was a bit of a poof. You were like, oh, mm-hmm. what? second you... one was a bit of a poof too. I wasn't very far off. I, I wasn't in the truck for the second one. It was just kind of like the, uh, so the EOD Jerv is, it was a totally different truck than what we were using. Um, they were rolling over a culvert to cross this. It was like this little dirt path over a culvert. Do you remember where these were? Can we find them on the map? Uh, you're going to have to go we south. Got... Down, so if you see that, nope, go back over to the uh, east or west. The main the main road, keep following that south. So follow that south. Now that road we called uh, MSR Tampa or main supply route Tampa is when we were there. And you're going to have to go far south. <laughs> um we were probably bordering the AO of um, uh, Fob Anaconda at the time, which I, I believe it uh, changed to Fob Freedom at one point, if I'm not where, mistaken. Do you remember whereabouts that was? Because there is a point where this crosses, uh, it looks like it crosses a bridge over top of a canal of sorts. Okay, so... This is the yeah. Katin Canal. That's it. Right there along the canal. So if you, the right side of the canal, the east side of the canal, if you follow that down. We're at. Keep keep following south. South, south, south. South, south, south. Maybe that's not it. Oh, yep, no. Keep keep following the canal south. So we okay, broke we'll off the, the main now. MSR to follow that road right there. And that's the road we got hit on. Right here? What you're following, yep. And it was EOD rated at about... 600 pounds of hme so hme wow. is homemade explosive basically they take fertilizer uh, you're gonna probably have to bleep this out but fertilizer and diesel and they bake it in a fucking field in the sun i, I, I don't think and that's it turns any, into an explosive i don't think that's anything that uh you couldn't learn from reading the anarchist cookbook online well remember um what's his name uh timothy mcveigh blew up the fbi building in oklahoma with that same compound so, oh, <laughs> well well then everybody knows so but it was somewhere along this path um there's that we're getting the, down to fields it looks like uh it, it was it, before the break off it was the way, break off. it was north before the break off between the canal um and i remember being lucky because the way we got hit um we didn't roll right into the canal which, if we would have rolled right into the canal, it probably would have killed us all because it would have drowned us all. So, here, I'll, I'll hold right about, I'll find a landmark of some kind. Down. Down? Down. 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 So, back up a little bit. Actually, those dark spots, what are those? Where about? Left, right? Right under your mouse cursor. Right just at, at the bottom of the picture. Yeah, those right there. Uh, nope, that's I not it. I mean, a... Oh, of course, there wouldn't be a ground view. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll give you the pictures at the, the the end of this, and you can share it, you know, through the pod, you know, during the podcast while we're talking. But I mean, in the pictures I've got, you can literally see the canal uh, on the west hand side of the the two track there. It looks like there's in a the bow pictures in the road. So. Hey, there's a few of those, man. I mean, it, it was it was one of the worst roads. Um, so we rated a, a black black road, which means it's untravelable without route clearance. Now, you're looking at this. I'll make this full screen here. You know, being that close to the water, 
what were the precautions, if any, that you had in case you would have sent that MRAP straight into the water? There's nothing. There's nothing you can do. Um, the, the, the doors themselves are probably like over 300 pounds. Um, you know, for driver, passenger, back to doors, they were fucking heavy. And if there was, you know, any incline, you're not opening them easily. So, I mean, if we're rolled, good luck. I mean, we, we did have a case while we were deployed where an MRAP rolled into a, into a canal and drowned most of the personnel on board, what, which is very unfortunate. What, if anything, can someone do in that situation? Is there, there a way to not ditch much. your gear, cut? Uh, I'm assuming there's no seat belts in the damn thing. There are. There are? There are. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so the, the modern MRAPs, um, they, we all had four-point harnesses uh, in the back and the front, mm. uh, which the four-point harness is basically what saved my life during that debt. Um, well, so let's get on to that. So mm -hmm. the third detonation. Yes. Give me that play-by-play. -play. Where were you just before that happened in the MRAP? So it was a, it was a very weird day. Um it was early morning. We got called out. So route clearance was going down that road. We got called out. Uh, they found some IEDs. So we rolled out with the OD first thing in the morning. I got to say it might have been like six or seven o'clock. Like it was it was still the, the sun was still coming up. So we rolled out. We actually rolled over the place where I got blown up. Assisted EOD or assisted route clearance. The EOD blew up the IEDs that they had found. We rolled back over the same spot all the way back to the FOB. The second we're clearing our rifles at the, at the, so we'd have a point that you'd come up in the FOB and you'd have clearing barrels. So it was basically a 55 gallon drum with dirt in it. And you'd put your barrel, your rifle in there and clear it in there. So nobody gets hurt. If mm -hmm. something goes off, as we're doing that, we get a call, same route clearance unit got hit by an ID two wounded medevac flight so we we had to roll back out i was the driver of the lead truck uh it was a cayman mrap basically um you could probably find a stock photo of one of them somewhere i can send you the picture of mine um it was an mrap built in an mtv frame which is a, a triple axle six-wheeled cargo truck basically <laughs> and they just added a bunch of armor on top of it they were badass trucks though um Inline six cat turbo diesel with an Allison trans. They were fantastic trucks, man. They would pull through anything. So we're on our way back down that dirt road. When we cut off the MSR, if you scroll back north, you could see where we cut off the, the main supply route. Let's zoom out here a ways. So it'd be we're following that canal. Full, full, keep going north. Okay. See the, see the dip or the, uh, the hook to the west in the road right here. Uh, the, the main MSR oh, to the your main, right, oh, right up here. Yep. So follow that down. Down where? Down south? Keep going. Keep going south. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You want to go to the bend in the road. Along the, okay. this main route? So right, about right here, somewhere around there is where we would cut off Guide from my the cursor. main MSR out of the dirt, and then we'd follow the road down. Guide my cursor. Where about? <clears throat> um, so go west a little bit to the dirt road right here right there so you see the cut um just south or just south of your cursor you'd, you're gonna see like a little like curve up to the main msr so to the east up see that cut right here that's where we'd come in we we cut off the main msr and take that dirt road down and then hook south yeah, see, there's a looks like there's a little field right here. Well, and if you look to the west, you got a couple of craters right there, which were probably IEDs. Whereabouts? West. Where am I looking? To the left. Right there. You there. go. You got them. Right there. <laughs> probably most likely. Do you think one of those is yours? No. no, no, ours was much further south than that. I wonder if we can find it. I'm not sure. Um, you could probably look over again over the pictures. And when I when I actually send you the pictures of the, the vehicle we were at, uh, you might be able to find it then. Now, but the road, the road west of where your cursor is right next to the canal. That's the one we were on when we got hit right here. Yes. And it much further south, though. Well, here, let's go for it. Oop.
Let me know if anything starts to look familiar. Well, I mean, if you see a giant hole somewhere, because I doubt it's been buried. Now, is this is the, <laughs> this is the road right here? Yes. Okay. That is the road. We're gonna keep um, following that. Got God, a bit it of hurts a field. me to see that road. <laughs> well, so looking at this road now, to, what, what are I you... mean, I, I personally I remember it perfectly driving down that road because I was one of I was a driver at the time. Oh, I remember that cut over. So there was two. It was so it'd be further south than that because it's going to merge back into one road. That's somewhere where you're at and further south. I don't know. I like I said, I can't tell you exactly where it was, but and so there's a little road that cuts through here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there was a lot of little two tracks that cut through there. Looks like we're coming up on a merger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, see, it's been years, brother. <laughs> so I couldn't, I couldn't tell you where exactly it was at. Um, so along this track here, then. So we're yes. So somewhere along here, what happened? I'm gonna put you up on the screen while you tell okay. me this. So the ten seconds before the blast, describe to me what was happening. What was going through your mind, if anything, what you saw, what you remember? So basically it was just another normal day. Um, you know, it was normal for us to roll out with EOD and as a escort element to protect them while they took, you know, took care of IDs, took care of weapons caches. I mean, I got to see a lot of cool explosions <laughs> while I was there. Um <laughs> You know, just blowing up weapons, caches, IEDs. I mean, I think, and these guys were nuts. I think there's a um, special spot in every little boy's heart that loves explosions. And the older he gets, it never goes away. So I, I specifically remember a day in downtown Samara where we had a uh, the Navy EOD guys. They literally rolled up to a possible ID. I watched the passenger of the truck. And we're behind them in a Humvee. He opens his door. You could see him pop smoke on a fucking C4 charge and then just drop it in the hole, closed door, and then they rolled off and it went off. Hmm. It was the most badass shit I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, homie, you just dropped the C4 charge on a possible <laughs> ID, bro. <laughs> don't care. Don't care. Do you, do you think he did the action movie thing where you don't look at it, just keep going? <laughs> <laughs> well, all, I saw, all I saw was the door open. He, I, you saw it pop smoke, which is the, you know, the, the primer and the mm -hmm. timer for a C4 charge. And he just, just dropped it, <laughs> dropped it right into the hole. And I mean, it wasn't a, it ended up not being an IED because you can tell when EOD hits a IED, you can see the secondary explosion easily. You, you know, the difference between a couple pounds of C4 and then something added on top of it. Now, their IEDs was it a was it a big concussive blast was there a lot of fire I hear a lot of veterans describe that in the move the movies don't do it justice because they put a fireball and all kinds of crazy stuff even for just for grenades but mm -hmm. is so what was well, the, when what grenade were... let's let's just put this to bed right now when a grenade goes off there's no fucking fireball yeah no well, it's, it's you just, and I know that it's, it's a black cloud of fucking smoke and whoever's near it gets fragged <laughs> and that's it now what about their explosions their ieds because um, because you you mentioned that they they, they use a lot of fertilizer mm -hmm. is, is well, there it depends a... it depends on the um propellant that they used you know sometimes they would use hme um i don't know if i could talk about this but there was times where we found um plastique at you know like bomb making labs which like literal russian plastique Hmm. They actually had their hands on it. Do you which think is that was? Do you think that was left over? Or do you think maybe uh, somebody was shipping that in? I mean, this is obviously opinion. You know, you don't could have been shipping it in, but it could have also been remnants of the Afghan uh, uh, Afghan Russian war that just made its way over into Iraq. Okay. Now we're gonna focus in real tight now. But you got to remember too that they were buying arms from the Russian military. So well, yeah, yeah. That's another okay. 
we're I'm gonna let's put a pin in that one. Yeah, absolutely. I want <laughs> I, I want to I want to focus in for 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 a lot of people. They they may not know what this experience is like for for other soldiers who are in your situation. They they probably know, uh, but I I want to ask when that blast went off. What was that like? How how did that feel in that instant? So it's it's an interesting feeling. Um, it's uh, so with the amount and the concussive force that we got hit by, it was almost like I was dazed and confused uh, when it first went off because I I don't remember it actually going off. It happened like like that. It you've, was fast. You've told me before in personal conversations, but mm-hmm. we, but you know for for further record, where were you just before the blast? And what happened? Where were you immediately after? So we were we were on the road that you've been showing. But but I mean um, I mean you physically in the MRAP. Where were so where, I was driving the MRAP. Okay, so you're I so, was the driver of the vehicle. So one second you're seeing the road in front of you. Yes. And then what's the the split next sec- second when I kind of came to before I blacked out? I remember seeing nothing but road through the through the windshield, and I thought, holy fuck! I like I literally thought I was about to die. Um, it was, it, it was very weird. Um, cause literally I'm, I'm one second driving down this dirt road in a big ass MRAP and it's like, and I'm like out of it. And then I remember seeing the road through the windshield and I'm like, fuck, which means we're 38,000 pound MRAP. We're nose up like this, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not a good situation. Um, no. when I woke up. Um, literally I was laying on my side because we had rolled onto our left side. So my driver's side door was pinned against the ground. Um, and that's, that's literally like, that's when I came to, I remember waking up, looking at my left. Okay. Ground through the windshield, looking up, right. Seeing my LT still strapped in his seat with the four point harness. And I started trying to call, you know, for the guys behind us, Hey, we need help. We're fucked. (laughs) You know? What did you hear back when you were calling? Uh, nothing. Um, so when I started calling, um, I remember hearing a, like a, a high pitch buzz and it kind of drained down like when, you know, a piece of electronic like loses power. Um, describe I, that Describe so, that for those who might not know. Is your radio tied into the MRAP? Or were you wearing absolutely. one? So every, every soldier in the MRAP is wearing a Bose headset that easily straps over their helmet. Um, you have internal communications with you if you flip there's a little like you got a box that hangs off of it Mm -hmm. flip the switch up it's internal comms flip the switch down it's external comms to whatever radio you're tied to in the mrap which we always carried two one for local comms one for direct communication with battalion was your lieutenant conscious when you looked at him not so initially no um i remember waking up I remember realizing that, you know, why it happened. And I started trying to call. I remember hearing that, which sorry for everybody on the podcast, but that's what I heard in the headset. So I fucking tore that off. I ripped my harness off. And I remember seeing my squad leader, Corporal Wilson. Love you, buddy. Um, He was, I could see him laying in the back just reaching out for me to help. So I've just, I I didn't even fucking give it a thought. Um, the the... body armor we had at the time, uh, it was one of those quick releases. So Mm -hmm. you could, you had a tab right here at the top, you could pull it and the two plates would split. So I pulled that immediately. I started trying to get him out. And I remember my Lieutenant that was still strapped in above me. He said, Hey, I got him. Get out, help the rest. And so I, I had to literally crawl out through the gunner's turret to get out to help start pulling people out of the back of the truck. When you got out, describe to me what you saw around you with your MRAP flipped. And was there still smoke in the air? What, what were no. the guys behind you doing? So EOD and our uh, rear truck was already on us. Um, rear truck was providing security. EOD truck with their gunner was pr- providing security. Uh, any any personnel in our platoon that was able 
that was not dedicated to the truck was out and trying to assist. Um, you know, we had our medic on scene, uh, Doc Torres. I love you, Brady. Uh, he did some fantastic work during that. Saved a lot of people's lives. If you could say anything to the doc now, what would you say? I miss you, bro. <laughs> I miss you. He's a good man. Yeah, I've heard. I, I've heard. There's two people you shouldn't fuck with: Doc <laughs> and the LT. <laughs> no, 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 no. Fuck the LT. Fuck doc the and LT. Supply. <laughs> doc, doc and, and supply. supply. You always want to make friends and supply <laughs> with your medics, and then uh, your uh, S1 and S2 because they're the ones that run your leave. <laughs> so you want to make friends with the, those three. See, I I, I get the, I get Doc and LT from the fat electrician because <laughs> Do, Doc's the guy that everybody loves, and mm-hmm. LT's the only one who cares about you know Geneva Convention, rules of war. <laughs> we don't ta- need him. If you take e- if you take either one of them out, uh, the the fat electrician often said that the default mode for the U.S. military is default aggression. <laughs> That's not wrong. Can yeah, you... That is not wrong. So we're, we're, I want to get into that just after this. But yeah. So yeah, yeah. It, the aftermath, the aftermath of it, you're, you're standing, sitting, describe to me w- when, when it was, when, w- w- what's the moment when you s- thought to yourself, okay, it's done. That just happened. The moment I thought that is when I was sitting in the back of our, um, rear truck and i was able to relax finally so describe to me the lead up to that moment so lead up to that was pretty much you're assisting everybody that's hurt um so i'm gonna get a little graphic for the audience pretty much everybody in the back of the truck had lost a leg if not both from the knee down uh, when the id went off so now, when now I for sorry, yep. but for those, no, go ahead. When you say lost a leg or two from the, from the knee down, do you mean separated or do you mean gone? Missed. Um, separated. Um, so I mean the 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 body parts were still in the truck, obviously. You know, it, what? That's... I, I if if you're willing to get into to it, mm-hmm. what's that like? to see someone's bite. I've seen horrific industrial accidents in my mm-hmm. life. I've seen men stick their hands into centrifuges and they just pop off. Yep. What is it like for you in a war zone to see the man here and his limb over there? You don't think about it at the time. But um, but I mean, so after during, the fact, after, after yeah, it definitely messes with you for a while. Um, seeing people that you called brothers, you know, getting hurt like that, it, it changes you for sure. What did you say to any of them when, well, ha- when it happened? The biggest thing I remember from that is when I got out, everybody was working on the three soldiers we had in the back, um, I got stuck helping Aaron. Well, it wasn't I got stuck. It's, you know, hey, Damon, help the re- the interpreter because the interpreter was in the back of our truck as well. And he lost both legs from the knee down and had a large laceration on his left thigh, inner, inner left thigh. So when I got to him and I started treating him, I um, it was we used a quick clot bandage on the laceration on his inner left thigh. And then it was my job to tourniquet both of his uh, thighs at the hip um, just because otherwise he would have bled out and died. I mean, it was, you know, both both from the knee down were separated. What what was his state? Was was he because we've all seen the movies. Mm -hmm. We've all seen Private Ryan where someone it's not like you think. Well, I'm going to tell you that right now. Um, So he had been messed up so badly that he had forgotten how to spoke English. Um, so, so he was yelling and screaming at me in uh, the lang- you know, the language that they spoke there. And it's, you know, I can't communicate with that. I don't know that language. Um, but yeah, no, the, the head trauma was so bad with him that he had literally forgotten how to spoke English. And then when 
couple months down the road when he was stabilized and he came to visit us at our FOB, he still couldn't speak English. Wow. No. And he had studied English at Baghdad University. Now, what, now, now what, what were you saying to him in the moment? It's okay, buddy. It's good. You're, you're all right. I pretty much, you know, I got you. Just stay down. You're okay. You're going to be fine. You know, it's, uh, he kept trying to, you know, he couldn't understand me. So he kept trying to like sit himself up and I had to keep pushing him on his chest. I'm like, Max, stay down. You know, you got to lay still. Otherwise you're going to die. What was his name? Uh, so his real name was Mohammed, obviously, mm -hmm. but we all called him Max. As, as are Max many over there. The, you know, <laughs> Max was a cool dude. Now, when he came to visit you after, and I'm assuming he had an, he, him being the interpreter, but forgetting to speak English, he must have had an interpreter with him to communicate. What did he say to you and what did you say to him when he came to visit after? So he had a family member interpreting for him. Um, he, I remember I got called down to the battalion talk. And they were like, Max is here. He wants to see you. And I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, I want to see Max. Like, that was my boy, the whole fucking tour up until that point. Yeah, He rolled out with us every fucking day. Every day he was in our truck rolling with us. And he literally just wanted to make his country better. And then got hurt. And I remember him, he told his family member, he said, thank you. That's that's the biggest thing was thank you, because I was the one who basically tourniqueted him and put the quick clock bandage on his laceration. So, I mean, I'm responsible for him surviving. If you could if you could meet with him, if you could say anything to him now, what what would that be? I don't know, <laughs> to be honest with you, man, I like if I could just hang out with him for a day, I just take him out around here in America. He's <laughs> shown what true freedom is, you know, if, uh, what his country could have had until we abandoned his country. You know, we went in and we fucked shit up and we abandoned it. If, if, if I can ever put that together, I, I'll, 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 I'll see what I can do. Oh. If I'm, so, so, so see if he's still around, but um, I hope so. That, I just, I, I have low hopes after the rise and fall of ISIS, unfortunately. Well, so, you know, to, to uh, another pin we're going to have to put in. So the, <laughs> the, your fellow Americans who were in that blast, mm -hmm. you mainly helped the interpreter, but w yes. you know, were, did, did you get to say anything before the rest of them got medevaced away? Did you, were there, were those were any moments that you remember immediately after that, that really, so that really reason... stick with you? there really wasn't much time for words. Everybody was doing what they needed to do. Um, whether it was, you know, I mean, all of us were trained in some sort of medical treatment so we could help, we could at least assist the medic that was on, on, on duty with us and help stabilize people, at least until the Blackhawks got there, the med flights. Um, God rest his soul, Brandon, all I, uh, the one main thing I remember is, is he asked me if he would ever walk again as we were putting him on the Black Hawk before he passed and during the night, uh, the life flight. What did you tell him? I said, you're good, buddy. You're going to walk again. We'll see you soon. And well, he didn't survive the flight. I've gone through many periods in my life where I've questioned whether there's an afterlife and whether we get to say goodbye and see people again. If you get to see Brandon again, what would you like to say to him? Uh, Ohio State sucks. Go Michigan. Because <laughs> he was an Ohioan just like you, brother. <laughs> From Cincinnati, born and raised. Those are some good old boys down there. Yep. Well, we, 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 that was one of the biggest things when he became my roommate and I was in charge of him. We used to talk shit about U of M and Ohio State all the time. Is there anything in his memory that you'd like to say or share 
with the world. There's not much else that can be said besides his parents, uh, what they have done uh, since he passed. Uh, I've been able to participate in several uh, what we called Heroes on the Lake, and they brought out veterans and active duty soldiers from our past unit that we served with to a lake called Dale Hollow at the uh, border of Tennessee and Kentucky runs through it. And they've literally gotten like professional bass fishermen to take us out and go fish. And it's been the coolest experience I've ever been a part of. And it's the best way to remember them. Do they still do that? Uh, so COVID threw a wrench in that and we haven't done it since, unfortunately. You and me are going to have to see if we can get that back going. Well, that, they always want me to come amazing. down. They keep asking me. So <laughs> I'm sure we can go down together and go visit and go get out and uh, go hit some smallmouth on Dale Hollow, man. That sounds fun. <laughs> that sounds fun. Smallmouth is a blast. Well, in Brandon's memory. Cheers, sir. Now, we get past that. How has your time serving affected you in the years returning to civilian life? So it, it took me uh, a lot of years to try and... <laughs> there was many years where I was still in that mode, right? So hypervigilant, always on edge, always aggressive. And it was something that was very hard to get over. Is there ever a point where in public you, with that aggression, you, that you look back on and tell me some about that. You know, um, going out to public places, bars, somebody saying just the smallest thing to me. I mean, it just like, yeah, I was always on edge, hyper vigilant, su super easy to get aggressive. I give, mean, but give you've me, got to remember as, as an infantryman, that was that's that's how we were trained we were trained to be aggressive constantly and then that was the job field you have to be take the fight to the enemy mm -hmm. yeah exactly you, if... there's no room for people hesitating it's you do your job otherwise somebody's going to die now you know, give me give me some of those moments what you know what you don't have to say what they said mm -hmm. but you know what you know, give give me a give me a situation where it set that off for you, where you, where, where you, you, you let that out. And, and, and in that, what was there a moment during that incident where you thought to yourself, you know, whole, I'm not there anymore. This is an American that he's not the enemy. So I've, I've got a good example of that one. Uh, so as I said, I spent a lot of time behind the driver's seat of, a, you know, Humvees, uh, MRAPs, all that stuff. <clears throat> now, I remember I, I came home for my mid-tour leave. It was a month after I turned 21, which was great because I drank the whole time I was here for 18 days. Um, <laughs> lots yeah. of other fun stuff that so, happened during so, that time. Sounds like a Michigan boy to me. Uh, yep. Um, <laughs> but I remember I was hanging out with an old friend and I was drinking driving my mom's minivan and we were going down one of the main strips here in Michigan and our roads suck. Everybody knows Michigan roads suck, right? Yeah. No, Ohio too. So, we're right and there with one you. of the big things was while we were there, you see a pothole. Usually there's probably an IED in there. And I remember driving with my friend and I had a full on panic attack because I, I saw a pothole that something that was reminiscent of, the IEDs we were running into, you know, over in Iraq. And I remember swerving over and pulling into a, a parking lot. And she's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm home. It's okay. I'm good. It, like I had to, I had to come down and center myself because, was, you know, I just spent 10 months in Iraq dodging IEDs, you know. Before you brought yourself down, what described to me, what being up here was, what, what, well, what, what, what did you feel? I was back in combat saw... mode, basically. Um, you know, the, it, seeing the pothole, it was very, like I said, it was very reminiscent of something that we'd see where uh, the insurgents in the area would use as a ID pot. They, Cause you'd find potholes all over the place, you know, maybe an explosion happened there, something happened there, but usually the ones you see that are kind of filled in, 
that would be the one. And that was kind of what it was. It was like a pothole and it was semi filled in with dirt and rubble and all this shit. And I just, it was, it was a immediate trigger. Is there, is there anything that you'd say to other service members who, who may ha- still to this day be having those, I don't want to call it an episode, but those, mm-hmm. the, the, those moments of being back there is there anything you'd like to say to them to 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 help them or to to console them is there any advice that you give them as to how to deal with that that those strong emotions that those come from the basest level of humanity where you wind up back there for for that briefest of instance yep all i gotta say is brothers and sisters you're home and it's okay that's it. it it's it's going to take time. It'll take time. I mean, it took me damn near 10 years uh, to get over all of my triggers and my hypervigilance and all that. I mean, I, I still have hypervigilance because, I'm you know, I'm a father now. So, you know, that, <laughs> that doesn't go away. But the constant fear of something happening, it'll get better. I promise. Just talk to your fellow veterans. You know, is, is that something that you think transcends the era, transcends the tour, being able to talk to a fellow veteran and, and, and discuss with them what had happened to you? Do you think it's easier to discuss that with another veteran as opposed to... Oh, absolutely. To... Absolutely. Um, you know, I've... I've talked to therapists that were non-veterans and it's just weird Um, to me at least because in the back of my mind, they don't, they can't fathom some of the things that we've seen, we've done, we've been through. Um, I think the, the best therapy I've had is starting my game group that is mostly veterans and gaming with fellow fellow veterans and being able to share the experiences just over light gaming and talking. It's been the best therapy for me. You know, I've been, I've been thankful to be a part of that group to, Mm -hmm. you know, to be able to, to, I, you guys may find it therapeutic. Those of you who've seen combat, who've who've yeah. been there in the action and uh, I find it mesmerizing. I find it <clears throat> I find it breathtaking in a way to hear these stories and as a I as a Greek, I I've grown up, you know, with, with my culture, the Iliad, the Odyssey. The, yep. the, these tales of great warriors and th- th- there's a tradition with greek culture to listen and to hear soldiers and warriors talk about the situations they've been in the experiences they've had and to really grasp and and know and dig deep and learn about what had happened to them to be able to sit there and listen to you and others talk about what happened to you. I don't find there to be anything shameful in listening to whether it be you or well, you might learn something. Well, you know, and not only that, but you know, to, to there's hearing my grandfather talk about Korea. He won't talk about any of the, the real dirty, in his mind, nasty, and yep. and oh yeah, in many I cases, mean, that was a dirty war. <laughs> it was not a fun one. It to, you know, he 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 won't discuss certain aspects of what happened. You know, one of the things that he he'll he'll say it, but then he'll try to immediately brush away is you know the only way we could stop them was we'd bring up fifty five gallon drums of oil, poke holes in them roll them down the hill 
and we blow them up and the fire yep. is the only way we could drive them back. Yep. He, he won't talk. It, once he says that. It's can't done. talk. No, it's, it's, it's and you, that is absolutely post-traumatic stress. Absolutely. He, um, he's never had nightmares. He's never had, um, that he's admitted to that he's admitted to, but he's never had those moments where, you know, you can, well, I don't know, looking, thinking about it now, looking back, there have been times where, you know, talking to him, you know, when, when it starts to get to what did it sound like, he kind of, you, you can see his face change mm-hmm. and he says it was, it was deafening and he, he and cha- changes the subject, stress. changes that's the subject. That's right there. That's, that's exactly what that is though. You know, you know, he, when he starts thinking about that trauma and you see that change in his facial expression that's ex- absolutely what that is if you could... you're you're thinking about those bad times those really shitty situations that you went through as a person if you let me back let me back up this train of thought yeah 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 if you know listening to you and others talk about your stories i find that you know being that fly on the wall and and just absorbing that information, I find that many veterans like you, they, they, there's an openness that you have with a fellow veteran. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost it, it's that camaraderie. It's that well, because, it's a sense of we know they, we know that they've they've experienced similar things to us, and it's easier for us to talk to veterans. Absolutely. I mean, you, you think about it. You know, it's for me, it's hard to talk to what I call a civilian, which would be you because you haven't experienced the same things I have. You haven't served. Whereas the other, the gentlemen in my, the, the gaming group that I'm running right now, you know, most of them are veterans and we, I, it's fantastic on, because we can all talk and share the same thing because we've all experienced combat. On that note, there's no such thing as a shameful plug. If you want to shamelessly plug <laughs> Best owned veteran gaming <laughs> for all those. Well, there you go. There you go. There's the plug. Hey, any vets watching this group? Um, best owned veteran gaming. Uh, we are a group of mostly veterans. It's a safe place. We even have a chaplain who's current coasty, and that's what he wants to do. <laughs> so, you're looking for a group of vets to come hang out, um, have similar passions with uh, people you can talk to. Look us up. You'll find us. Bastone Veteran Gaming. You know, I, this this might be a little into the weeds for some people, but, you know, on, on, on this track of, you know, talking about, you know, veterans speaking to veterans, there was um, there was a YouTuber back in the day. Um, his name was Lindy Beige. I believe he still posts to this day. Uh, but he, he often, it was something that he said, well, he didn't say often, but one, one time I remember, you know, he... Um, he spoke about, you know, what if you took a a modern soldier from the 20th century or 21st and you had them speak to a Roman of the 1st century BC who served. And, you know, what what would they be able to relate and would they be able to have a talk? Now, war nowadays and for since the dawn of the 20th century has been conducted at a distance, mm-hmm. but there is, there's this, but during the Roman times, it was very much up close and personal up, and people right literally face. bashing each other's heads in, in front of each other. Um, I don't, you know, think... I think we could relate in some way. I, I do think we could relate. Um, you know, the, the method of war may change, but war is still the same. It's still man versus man. That visceral nature of war, that that primal aggression, mm-hmm. that was there ever a point where you felt like you hated the enemy for what they'd done, or for or, or, or for for the, the 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 gall that they had to stand before you? Was there so, ever was there ever a moment like that? Not really. No, it we were it was just we were there to do a job that's it 
um, our job was to help secure Iraq for a better purpose. Uh, and that's the, you know, when we deployed in 2007, it was under the second surge under Bush, you know, and it, that was the whole point was to surge troops into Iraq to help secure it. Uh, and, you know, we were getting a lot of foreign fighters from like Syria and Iran, um, big time. Really? Big time. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, a few of the people we took in were Syrian nationals, my unit in particular. You know, to, to kind of pull a pin out here and put it up forefront, you know, the that aspect of the war being in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Before our invasion, Iraq had few friends in the area. Yep. You know, they had fought border conflicts with Syria. They had had a large war with Iran. What was the perspective from those fighters who came and, and, you know, w- w- did, did they feel like they were trying to make a better Iraq or were they trying to exact some sort of, of you know, vengeance for what had befallen them in the past? So it seemed like most of the people we ran into just wanted to fight Americans. Really? Or kill Americans. Oh, yeah. They, they, they had no other purpose from being there. I mean, it, especially the foreign fighters that we picked up from Syria, um, you know, they, they, they had no reason being there besides to try and fight us. Do you, this may sound odd, but do you take that as a compliment? Well, you know, maybe not a compliment, but it, I guess if you're, if you really want to die, you can, you know, come try to fight the best military force in the world, you know? You can die against um, the best of them. <laughs> you know, we, we did lose too many people in Iraq, for sure. Um, but we also to put a lot of terrorists underground as well. Did did you ever get to speak to any of them, those that had fought against you? No. No. No, nope. not a single one. Is there anything that you would like to say to them if you had the chance? Not really. I mean, I get the foreign fighters shouldn't have been there, um, but the people, the, the actual Iraqis that, we fought against i i understand that they felt that we were there wrongfully um that's their choice i mean it's it's their country you know we would feel the same way if somebody invaded america you know um and they were fighting for their own freedom and sovereignty but we were there trying to help at least that's what we were told now you know to to back up slightly if you could sit down with a Roman legionnaire or a Greek hoplite, what would you say to them? What would you, how would you start the conversation? Was there anything particular that comes to mind that from your era to theirs that you would say is different or I understand in some way? Well, first off, I would introduce them to the M240 Bravo machine gun. (laughs) <laughs> and show them what it is to live in the 21st century and engage your enemies from a distance. Um, and then I would absolutely question them on what was war like in your time. I would want to know. I mean, it just it's it's so fascinating when armies used to face each other in line formations and then just bash each other's heads in until the one side gave up. <laughs> well, there's there's a term that and you know many civilians don't know the LSP last safe position mm-hmm. and you know back then that was about 6 feet away they were from 6 <laughs> they were from 6 to 15 feet depending on if you're using spear or pike you yep. know is there you know a, as war continues to get more and more distant from one another uh, you know do do you ever feel there was a his name escapes me at the moment, but there was a king of Syracuse who once said that uh, he, he was shown one of the first ballistas to ever to ever be used. They were brought for his mm-hmm. sire. You must see this, this great invention. No foe will stand before us. And, you know, to seeing this weapon be used and, and being, being shot, you know, so far and, and, and this machine being used to kill humans. 
he, what he he he's said to have broken down and wept and cried to the sky. Zeus, hear me, the valor of man is no more. Is is there any aspect of that that you that you take in, and that you understand deeper, being a veteran and, and having war conducted at such a distance now? Well, see, if you look at it, you know, my profession, I was a mortarman or indirect fire infantryman, and we used mortar gun systems. And it, it's kind of close to if you think of like a trebuchet or a ballista, you know, it's an indirect fire weapon. Um, and obviously our mortars were indirect fire mass kill weaponry. Uh, the, the 120 millimeter mortar HE round, if you burst, uh, if you do a uh, pre-surface burst, which is above ground burst, uh, it's got a frag radius of or instant kill radius of 75 meters. So if you're within those 75 meters of a 120 going off, you're dead. <laughs> you now, know, is that like, for those who may not know, is that the concussive blast or is that just pure? It'd shrapnel? be part of the concussive blast and shrapnel. Okay. At the same time, uh, and then the frag radius would have been about one 120 meters from point of detonation. Is there an aspect of that that you? wish wasn't a thing in modern war do you, do, you, do you, is there ever a point where you think to yourself i wish i wish i could have been a little closer to that well so my time as a mortarman i had a certain job my job was to protect the guys on the ground on the front lines um you know that that was the job of a mortar you're you're providing indirect fire support for frontline troops um so no i i loved my job as a mortarman I, there's no other job like it in the military absolutely not maybe now, artillery it's a little different though you know you're breech loading instead of dropping around down a barrel now you know to to continue on a little bit uh we we, we put a pin in another subject your your feelings about the war as a whole how 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 has that changed from when you began to prior to your service in your service and now post service. Well, so when I joined, you know, I remember, I remember watching the two towers fall in my third period class of freshman year of high school. I remember just train. Yeah, I'm on my way to my third period, and then I remember all the all the teachers coming out of the classrooms and like just come on, let's go, ushering everybody in, and it was like, well, what the fuck is going on? And then I just remember, you know, the TV on and the first tower had been hit. And I remember watching the second tower get hit. And I remember that day I was like, I want to serve my country like my grandparents did. You know, during wartime, because we're obviously, you know, I knew at that point we were going to war. You know, we, we don't our country as a whole, we don't take actions like that lightly, obviously. <laughs> now, now, after the fact. You know, mm -hmm. being out for all the years that you have, what perspective do you have now, and how how has it differed from those initial gut feelings and those emotions that you had in that moment? So I'd say during the time, you know, I was gung ho, I was ready to go, I was ready to go fight for our country, but you know, now looking at all the political garbage, you know, that we're starting to learn about that took place during, you know, for the the Iraq War. You know, then obviously this is my opinion. You know, we did some good for them while we were there, but then we abandoned them to ISIS, and now the country's in turmoil. Now, you know, and then look what happened with Afghanistan. Our, our current administration pulled out the way they did, and we left a lot of people that were loyal to us behind to die under the hands of, you know, the Taliban. Is, or is there anything that you, being your opinion, that you would like to say now that in the moment you felt like you were doing your job, you were very professional, mm -hmm. you know, had a, had, a, had a sense of duty. Is there anything now you'd like to say to the powers that be in the past or currently that that you were unable to express at the time or that, or that you've learned now with years being out of the service? 
no, I, I, I so everybody above me was following orders. You know, it, it, these orders were coming down from the executive branch, you know, do this, do that. Okay. Roger president. We'll get, we'll take care of it for you. You know, um, at the time, yeah, I th obviously thought, you know, I was there for a purpose, but you know, after seeing everything we did in Iraq, you know, it's kind of like we did what we did and we brought stability to the region, but at the end of the day, we let ISIS take it over and fuck the country up even worse than when we left it. You know, is, is there any parallels that you can see through history or in, or in other wars that have happened that remind you of what happened in your situation? Um, I mean, I guess Vietnam. I mean, look at how we pulled out of Vietnam. You know, we left a lot of people behind uh, just like in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, it's, it's funny how history repeats itself sometimes, you know, you know, they, they call Afghanistan the graveyard of empires and <laughs> it, you know, they, um, uh, I, I believe the current administration even at one point said, you know, there, there will be no Chinooks grabbing people off of rooftops like we had in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And there are side by side images it. of yep. Yep. from side Vietnam by side images to now. And you know, you've got, you know, that's that championship of the Biden administration. You know, we the way we pulled out of out of Afghanistan was, was just deplorable. Um, you know, we left a, a lot of allies behind, uh, interpreters, people that were loyal to our government, helping our government against the Taliban, and we just left them and let them get murdered. You know, it literally took civilian organizations like uh, Tim Kennedy's organization to go and save these people. It's it's fucking ridiculous. I'm going to fucking ridiculous. It's heart wrenching. It shouldn't take civilian organizations to go and rescue these people. It should have been our government from day one. That. The do you ever for a for a moment think that so you hear oftentimes you know people who are more complacent in life they you know the the government has our best interests at heart <laughs> I can tell by your reaction there what your answer no, is going don't. to be yeah no, well. You know, is there ever a time where you think, you know, the the wars that we fight, the the purpose is lost almost immediately after the declaration? Um, I mean, not if you think about it, not really, because, yeah, as controversial as the Vietnam War was, you know, we were trying to stop the spread of communism, which at this point funny thing is is vietnam is kind of like a capitalist socialist republic you know they're very capitalist they sell a lot of stuff to uh, america now so i mean obviously true communism didn't survive there um we did what we needed to do in korea you know we separated the states and stopped the advance of communism there at least although if you think about it technically we're still at war because we've it's we've never you know signed a ceasefire with them um but no i don't I, there's a lot of stupid places our our country's gone for the right reasons some of them we probably shouldn't have been there but at the end of the day how, how are you going to change history history's already happened you know you know communism did not survive in Vietnam, do you think the regimes that we left behind that filled the void of American presence, do you think those will survive into the future? Or do you think they're doomed to the same fate as our former enemies? That's an inter That's a very, very interesting uh, question there. Um, well, I mean, if you look at Iraq and Afghanistan, the most two recent um, current government Iraq can't stand us. Uh, and then you, in Afghanistan, uh, a place we fought in for years now, is now ruled by the Taliban. So, I mean, honestly, 
at some point we need to stop sticking our noses in other people's business and just worry about our own country. Yeah. I, I've, I've often wondered that I've got potholes. I've got potholes outside on the road just past my driveway. We can't seem to fix those, but yeah, we can bomb somebody clear over in the middle East. Yep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No. And you know, people are working currently, you know, yeah. Employment's up in our country, but we've got people working multiple jobs just to make ends meet while we're sending billions overseas. You know, you wonder how much padding <clears throat> that is of the numbers mm-hmm. when you consider how many that, you know, my grandfather's era, you know, in 1957, my grandfather, he, he, he had come back. It had been seven years or sorry. It had been four years since his uh, tour in our, in Korea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was able to get a job uh, working for United Engineering, and he worked there for 30 years and retired. But but in 1957, he was making about you know fifteen thousand uh, dollars a year, adjusted for inflation. It's one hundred and forty seven thousand dollars. Yeah, no, you're <laughs> the, I, He's I, a I, very I, well off man at that time. I, I, and this was a union facility. It still is a union facility. I, I, working at a union yard, I was management at a scrap facility, and I was barely making more than fifty. Yeah. So, so to just you know, to consider, and I was in charge of grinders, welders, laborers who were making oh, yeah. more than me. Now to compare that from 1957 to now, he was effectively making three times more money than myself. Yep. How? How? Well, has the, ha, has this I mean, I several things that I blame are the the I blame number one not being on some sort of a standard, be it gold. When we or got something. rid of the gold standard, then we started printing money. Uh, our dollar value went down. Fractional reserve and banking. You had to make. Yep. There's yep. another one. <laughs> you know the, the these different aspects. Do you do you think that service members are paid adequately now compared to the past in history? Granted, in the past it was a necessity. We had more. We had the drafts, which were a form of conscription, versus nowadays. I mean, we being te- technically still have the draft. The we draft still do still selective thing. service. Uh, you know, you, eighteen years old for a man, you got to apply for selective service. I did it at eighteen, even though I was joining already. So, do you, do you think that our soldiers are taken care of and compensated adequately in the modern world? So, um, I think we've, uh, unfortunately we've allowed too many veterans to slip through the cracks for care, um, prior, uh, after service, uh, you know, during service is all right. You know, depending if you get a good unit, which is still bullshit because every unit should be the same. Uh, all the officers should act in the same accordance, the same with the, uh, senior NCOs, um, but I think it, veteran care is quite deplorable. Uh, we don't put enough money into it. Um, I think our disabled veterans deserve more than what they get. Um, myself included. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone for mental health assistance at uh, John D. Dingle. Oops, sorry to drop that one in Detroit. Um, and I've just have had terrible service. Like, it just don't. It, it almost seems like I'm just another body coming in to get help, and they don't really give a shit. My my grandfather broke his hip on Labor Day uh, this last year, and mm-hmm. he, um, you know, we've we've been in and out of the VA, and it, it took us years to convince him to you know to go to the VA to ask for some sort of assistance in his living. He 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 was always under the perspective of, you know, he's he's 92 now, you know, he he can still. He can still get up and walk around. He utilizes a walker and a wheelchair now, but yeah, he was always under the perspective that he he's better off than those that aren't, and he'd rather the funds go to someone who needs it. It took a lot but of he deserves it. It took a lot of convincing from mm-hmm. myself, my father, my aunt, everyone to explain to him 
that he not only deserves it, but he earned it. The yeah, and everybody in the military, look, it, it doesn't matter if you if you have something wrong that is service connected, apply for it. You deserve it. You absolutely deserve it. It doesn't matter if it's tinnitus, which just about everybody us combat arms guys have, uh, to like you know bad hip or something. Just report it with the VA, because if you don't report it, they're going to deny you later down the road, and they're going to deny that you, that was service connected. I mean, I myself when I applied for my disability, I literally had to get the Purple Heart involved to get my claim through, because uh, for some reason. They couldn't find any of my medical records for my deployment. The, the VA, at least, you know, it, for some reason, they were all sealed. You know, the. <sighs> About every three to four weeks, well, once a month, I have to take my grandfather down to the VA and, yep. you know, walking in there before I had gone in to see it. He, 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 he would, it was right before I, I first took him down. He said, you know, son, when we get there, you know, don't, you don't stare, just, just keep going. And, you know, we're, we're going to find a seat. We're going to sit down. And I asked him, well, this, it's, it's, it should, it should be just like any other doctor's office visit. And he said, no, you, you don't understand. He, he can't, when, when, when some of those men come up to him, and you know they they say you know welcome home buddy there he you know he 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 thanks them but he he looks back because he told me he said some of those men are missing all of their limbs they're mm-hmm. missing arms and legs and you know he for some reason thinks that because he has all of his that he that that they deserve it more than he does, and you know, maybe there is a little aspect of that. You you've given more in some way, but I feel that every service member they went into the military to be all they could be, and they gave all they had, no matter what they came back with. Yep, and the the experiences at the VA being there you know seeing you know in many cases other Korean War veterans Vietnam veterans Desert Storm Iraq and Afghanistan you know seeing what a lot of these guys are dealing with is there anything that you being now that you're you've you've come back and, and you've had to deal with them you be it mental health or physical, is there anything that you think that this nation needs to do more for their service members? Well, I, I think the VA system needs a, a big revamp. Um, you know, contrary to popular belief, uh, a lot of VA hospitals will take somebody who's lost their medical license from another state, which I don't think is acceptable at all. Uh, you wow. know, you've and then... Um, I've been forced also personally at the Detroit VA to meet with um, uh, medical students from uh, University of Detroit Mercy. And it's like, well, I don't want to see you. I want to see my doctor. Well, we're, we're here because, you know, we're obviously they're doing their, you know, time as an intern. But it's like, I don't want to be your guinea pig for your internship. I'm sorry. I'm there for real reasons and real problems. And I don't want to have to explain something to a college, somebody who's not even a college grad yet, that I've explained several times over. What's on that, having to explain things over and over to people who've never experienced it, What's the one thing that ticks you off the most when people ask you it? Um, I, did you ever kill anybody? That's the biggest one. I mean, I, and you can ask any other service member. It's like, we don't, even if we did, we don't want to talk about it. You know, it's, it's taking life isn't a good thing, but sometimes it's, it's necessary. You know, we kind of get back towards, you know, the, um, the Homeric nature 
of, of and, and, and the Iliad, you know, th- these aspects of war, you know, they're, you know, back in the past, you know, these legionnaires, hoplites, even up until, you know, the, the 16th, 17th, 18th century, it, it was not something that people were told to shy away from this, this, you know, th- th- there were many a tales, you know, back in ancient Greece and in Rome where soldiers were encouraged to, you know, to say, you know, I, how, how many they slew in battle yep. and, and, and how, and to go into detail about it as we've, as time has progressed you, nowadays, all throughout, you, you know, being mm-hmm. a man in the modern world, you know, your, your mother, your father, they all tell you, don't hurt anyone. Don't be nice. Be good. Be just. And then we hand a young man a rifle or we give him charge of a mortar tube and we tell him, kill that guy over there. Mm-hmm. Well, it's in the moment, you just do what you're told. <laughs> you know, it you know is... uh, the couple of combat mortar shoots that I did that I was personally a part of while I was deployed in Iraq, I, you know, it was just you you get the deflection, charge number, elevation, and they tell you a fire for effect, which would be five rounds, and we just sling it. It wasn't, there was no thought in the world, okay, we're, we're putting rounds on an enemy. It's just, okay, we're doing what we're told to do at the moment. And then, you know, that I remember the first mortar shoot that I was a part of, I remember getting told afterwards that our platoon got 14 confirmed, but that was over probably about a five day period slinging rounds at a certain location. So <laughs> did you ever get to walk the impact sites from your rounds? No. Nope. Do you ever um, see pictures? No. Would you look at them if offered the opportunity? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the the one mortar shoot that we did, the first one, like I said, I can't say too much about. Um, we were danger close with troops. So we were basically walking uh, the infantry unit in. And <clears throat> for the people that know what I'm talking about, they know what I'm talking about. But for the civilians out there, when you walk fire in with an infantry unit, You've got your infantry unit here and you're walking in mortars in front of them as they're marching forward and you're getting constant corrections from your fire direction control. Now, having said what we've said and what I've said, you know, in, in the past, you know, th- there was a glorification of being, of mm-hmm. being in the fight and, and taking life, you know, do you see that as a do you see that as something good in the modern era that we've done away with the uh, you know you know be, be proud of what you've done or mm-hmm. or, or, do, or do you do, and on that same note do you see it as um does it take away from the effect when we tell when when you know other service members say that don't ask us about that. Is, is there any aspect of that? Or do you see it as a good thing that we've tucked that evil behind us as to, to not share that information? Well, first off, I'd like to say that even though I, even though we know it was glorified at one time, I still think it affected those soldiers the same way that it affects a modern soldier. Um, Although you do, if you're in the profession long enough, you know, I know people that have been completely desensitized to that kind of violence. And then I could see that being a thing during those times. Um, Granted, I think that when they started off, they probably were like, you know, holy shit, you know, I just bashed like five people's faces in. (laughs) It's like, I hate this, but they get desensitized to it. Just like when I was over there, um, you know, for the the short period of time I was compared to other people that have served, um, you get desensitized to it while you're there. Uh, You don't think about it. And then when you get back and you start having that time to yourself, that's when you really start thinking about it. So I think maybe those soldiers from that 
barbaric time when they finally retired, if they were lucky enough to retire and survive that long, probably had the same type of feelings that modern soldiers do. When, you know, there there are those soldiers out there who, who are... Um, I'm reminded of uh, that's that the the one scene in Full Metal Jacket, or um, I believe it's Full Metal Jacket when they're riding on the helicopter, and uh, the chopper gunner is just shooting men mm-hmm. in the field, and he just says, "I mean, that's a different time, though, man." I understand, <laughs> but <laughs> that's the, that we do. There was nothing like that while we were over in Iraq, for sure. There, there are likely, and, and there are you know, you, you if you look hard enough, you can find soldiers who 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 it's nothing to them to talk about you know the lives they've taken and the situations they've had what mm-hmm. what what's your opinion on that psychology it, it, do you think they've do you think it's just been that desensitized from them that they're that it's that open and blatant for them well you got to remember there's certain 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 people with different brain chemistries can handle trauma differently than most people um, a, a really good podcast that I watch, and I don't really want to name others on yours, but uh, Sean Ryan show, he's a former SEAL, and he had one of the Delta operators from that was in Somalia for Black Hawk Down, for anybody that doesn't know uh, Operation Gothic Serpent uh, as it, for its real name. Um, but it was his final interview about that certain mission. Uh, recently and i mean the man was probably one of the hardest (laughs) i mean he was a delta force literally in tears on this guy's podcast you know and he's 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 taken more life than i could ever even want to do so and such a humble person you know nico watching some of these tier one operators go over former operations they've done i'm I was a nobody, you know, I was just a, your fucking lineman mortarman in the 101st airborne. You know, I didn't do some of the stuff that these guys have done. And you look at them and they were, they were probably the hardest out of them all. And they still break down. Nico Ortiz has often said that Delta mm-hmm. force is straight baby killers. <laughs> is, is, well, that, is that, is that true from your, I've never operated with SEAL team. So, you uh, know, under, understandable, but, but from your knowledge, is that, is that something that as the higher tier you go, is it sort of a expected that these men have, have Uh-oh. taken more life, done more in a, in, in a, in a combat aspect than any other? I lost you for a second there. So you're going to have to repeat that question, buddy. <laughs> I was just saying is, you know, it, that, you know, is there an aspect to, Delta Force, the SEALs, these men are often, you know, they're often praised as being the toughest, the finest. Um, well, they are. The, well, <laughs> yeah. certainly from training. You've got to be a certain breed of human being to be able to pass the test to be in that. Well, I, you know, be in those Tier 1 operating units, Ranger, Marsoc, you know, Navy SEAL, Delta, you know, any of the ODAs, you know, or ODA, any of the special forces group, they, you've you got to be a different breed of human. Now, if you, if you were to. If and you I have had, a lot of respect for those men. Absolutely. If you were to have to do it all over again, is there anything you would have done different? pick a job that I can use when I get out. <laughs> That's the biggest one. Um, you know, you get out as an infantryman, especially being a mortar. Uh, what are you going to do? Okay. Border patrol, police agency, something like that. You know, it's like, well, I just did that. <laughs> so I want to do something else, but it's like, you know, I, I wish I would have done something more along the lines of like helicopter maintenance, uh, just because that's, you know, that's a high paying job when you get out. Certainly. Is, is there anything Is there anything that is there anything that you would like to do again? No, no, not at all. No, I I wouldn't trade any one of my experiences for anything. I would do it all over again. Um, I mean, it was obviously life changing. Um, I 
you know, uh, yeah, I wish I could have finally. So I, I ended up re-enlisting while I was deployed for Black Hawk Crew Chief. Didn't end up getting to do that, um, but that's fine. You know, I, I'm out. I'm a civilian now. I've been a civilian since October of 2009. Be, being a civilian, is there ever a time where you miss, you know, being a soldier? Is there ever a All time? All the time. It, um no, no. You know, what the, is it that you miss? The fraternity, the brotherhood. Um, you know, having a bunch of dudes that you can smoke and joke with all the time, a bunch of dudes that would have your back no matter what situation, would go into a gunfight with you. That's It's a feeling you can't get anywhere else. Now, is there anything that you would like to say to your descendants in the future or others who would join the military in the future about your experiences that you would, that you would like them to know and understand? Well, I mean, look, if you want to, if you want to go infantry, <laughs> you're, you're going to be infantry. But my recommendation is you pick a job that you can, if you're not gung ho about being a door kicker or some kind of special operations or something, pick yourself a job if you can, that you can use when you get out something that's going to make you money because it, there's nothing worse than getting out with no job skills and having to start from scratch in your, you know, early to mid twenties or like, let's say you retire in your forties and you get out and you didn't do any college while you're in, you know, there's nothing worse than that. Um, before we wrap things up, there is one tidbit back in the meat of it that I would like to touch on. Okay. We put this pin up here and we named it battle <laughs> for the Island. In the middle I don't know of the how much I can say for that one. Well, in the middle of the Tigris, mm -hmm. just to paint the picture for everyone, there's an engagement where you have insurgents on this Island right here. Can you, can you describe to me the battle at least your part of it. And so my happened. part of it is, um, so I was still with uh, headquarters mortar platoon. Uh, and I don't think I actually said my unit at all during this whole interview. Um, so I was headquarters mortar platoon, second battalion, three, two, seventh, first brigade combat team, 101st. And I know a lot of guys know that uh, good old no slack battalion for my no uh, fellow no slack bets out there. Um, so the engagement was, as we had, intel of possible insurgent activity on that island and my platoon's role was to provide indirect fire support via 81 millimeter and 120 millimeter mortar gun systems uh while we had scout platoon and i believe it was alpha company clearing the island um also during the engagement we had oh 58 kiowas uh, also making gun runs with 50 cals and rockets which were fucking fantastic to watch from a distance <laughs> um loud uh, i i mean my fellow vets out there will know how loud a fucking rocket is going off at a you know about a thousand meters a couple thousand meters it's still loud <laughs> is there anything particular from that battle that you remember um nothing really majorly in particular i mean it was it wasn't really much of a battle it was just us providing indirect fire support for troops on the island um that's that's pretty much it you know we we sling the rounds when we got called you know what's it like when somebody calls for fire support and you hear that over the radio it, so it gives you a sense of like especially if you hear troops in contact that gives you like a sense of like purpose like motivation you got to fucking move because you got friendlies your your brothers and sisters under fire so your job is to provide fire support for them immediately and help them. Uh, hey, there's nothing like hearing that and just, okay, I'm, I'm on it. I'm slinging rounds, you know, in that urgency, that, that immediate need to go to action, that call that you hear, you know, what, what is that feeling from within you that, 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 that hits first? It's an extreme urgency. Like I need to be on my shit. I need to know, I need to do everything perfectly and I need to move quickly. Now, 
if you could, is there anything that you'd say to the enemy that you faced out there? No. No. Um, no. It's, it was... Oh, let me think. I didn't hate them, but I was there to protect myself, my friends, and the citizens of Iraq, and that's it. I didn't look at them differently. I mean, yeah, there were times where we were kind of like, you know, trained to think that they were, you know, terrible people. But most of them were just poor farmers and people just trying to make ends meet. And the Taliban offered them a bunch of money to put an IED in or build an IED or, you know, do this or that. You know, and they, they, they get offered like a year's salary just to do this one act. And it, it would put a lot of innocent people with good intentions, but were doing bad things. And it got them killed. Is there anything in closing that you'd like to share before we end this? Um, I guess uh, to all my brothers and sisters out there, uh, you know, if you're suffering, keep your head up. It gets better. Promise. Yeah, to anyone out there who, you know, maybe quietly among themselves. <clears throat> if there's anyone out there. <clears throat> if there's anyone out there quietly among themselves. One second. Quietly among themselves suffering will always talk to you. Reach out to the VA. I know that's fucking tough to reach out to them sometimes. Just do it. You know, Joe, thank you very much for coming on. You know, yeah, absolutely, man. You know, this, um, <laughs> I appreciate you having me on and uh, allowing me to share my life and my story in the military. Well, and thank you for sharing. I, I feel too many people, um, you know, they don't share their experiences. They, you know, we, we, we touched on it here just shortly, uh, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, suffer in silence in a way. Yeah. Um, and I hope that hearing a fellow veteran express these experiences and describe what happened to them. And even with, with, you know, well over two and a half hours having this discussion, I still feel like we've only just barely scraped the surface. Oh yeah. Of, of I mean, there's so flight. many other stories I can tell, but you know, we can, we can do this another time <laughs> and Absolutely. keep expanding on it. Absolutely. Um, but for the vets out there suffering silence, look, I did it for a long time. It, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I promise. <laughs> Reach out, talk to a friend. That being said, I think that's, probably the perfect closing that we could have. Thank you, Joe, very much for being here with me. And thank you to all those who served. Um, and I want a few people to go out there and just tell somebody you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll thank me for my service. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have a good one, Joe. I appreciate you having me on, man. Absolutely. You too, brother. Bye.